Welcome to Samara. For seven years we have been meeting in October to discuss the most important scientific studies and discoveries in the field of brain-computer interfaces and related areas. We are glad to welcome all attendees, speakers and moderators at our conference. There are three days, five thematic sessions, 36 talks and unlimited knowledge ahead. The main topics of this year are neural interfaces and neurotechnologies in rehabilitation, mathematical neuromodeling, neurotechnologies in marketing, neurosociology and the special topic of this year, neuropsychiatry. Now for the official greeting and opening of our conference, I'm giving the floor to the head of the Samara State Medical University, Alexander Kalsanov. Уважаемые коллеги, рад приветствовать вас на нашей седьмой конференции «Нейрокомпьютерный интерфейс. Наука и практика». За эти годы конференция выросла из межрегиональной в международную и стала крупнейшей и авторитетнейшей в России и одной из самых известных в мире площадок, где ежегодно обсуждают развитие нейротехнологий лучшие российские и зарубежные ученые. И в этом году участие в конференции вновь примут ученые с мировым именем. Отмечу, что на предстоящей конференции, помимо других важных вопросов, мы обсудим самые актуальные на сегодня темы в рамках симпозиума COVID-19 и нейропсихиатрии. Ключевые выводы 2021. К сожалению, пандемия диктует свои условия, и второй год подряд мы вынуждены проводить конференцию в онлайн-формате. Тем не менее, я надеюсь, что это не помешает каждому участнику получить новые знания, обменяться бесценным опытом. И, конечно, ждем в будущем году встречи у нас в Самаре. Желаю всем успешной работы. COVID-19 pandemic changed everyone's life and this year we pay special attention to it at a symposium called COVID-19 and Neuropsychiatry – Key Findings to Keep in Mind in 2021. Let me introduce its moderators, Secretary General of the World Psychiatric Association, Peter Morozov and Director of International Center for Education and Research in Neuropsychiatry, Daria Smirnova. Hello, uh, uh, my name is uh, Peter Morozov. Mm, dear colleagues, dear guests of the conference Brain Computer Interface 2021. Uh, being a vice president of the Russian Society of Psychiatrists and the World Psychiatric Association General Secretary and an advisor, mentor, co head of the International Center for Education and Research in Neuropsychiatry, I would like to support uh, this important professional event, which attracts uh, the audience of the neuroscientists and clinicians to discuss the most acute topics in the area of brain research. We would like to express our gratitude to the Chancellor of the Samara State Medical University Professor Alexander Kolsano and the organizing committee whose idea was to include the symposium on the important clinical issue related to COVID-19 pandemic and mental health into the program of the conference Brain Computer Interface 2021. We live in the time of pandemic and we cannot ignore the topic about the influence of virus and the COVID-19 pandemic on the brain and human behavior nowadays. I'm sure that the presentation of the prominent speakers whom we invited to participate in the program will be interesting for the wide audience of participants working in the field of public health neurobiology, psychiatry, neurology, neuropsychopharmacology. My very best wishes of good luck and success to the conference and hope uh, for future collaboration. Thank you. Dear professors, dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm very glad uh, to see you today at our symposium 
this part we are going to talk about very complicated and sad issues of the COVID-19 and its effect on mental health. First of all, I would like to say thank you to the Prof. Peter Morozov, who is the General Secretary of the World Psychiatric Association and the Vice President of the Russian Society of Psychiatrists for his uh, very important welcome message and continuous support of all our educational and research initiatives. We would like to express our gratitude to the Chancellor of Samara State Medical University, Professor Alexander Kalsanov, as well as to Professor Vasily Patin and Dr. Luisa Karasirova for inviting us to contribute to this uh, very important professional event uh, called Brain Computer Interface 2021. So today we are going to talk about mental health and neuropsychiatry and COVID-19 the key findings to keep in mind um, nowadays. Uh, new coronavirus appeared unexpectedly indeed and brought devastating change to people's life, neurobiology of human brains and social behaviors. A strong damage to physical and mental health of the general population globally and uh, to the breakdown of healthcare systems which we unfortunately observed and as well as uh, it brought us really novel social phenomena including uh, the conspiracy uh, beliefs uh, related uh, to uh, the virus origin and uh, uh, the vaccination and uh, it really enforced us to step into the new era uh, with the needs of being fast and clear with our appropriate professional decision and responses. Our international team, which was has been partially uh, reunited under the auspices of the International Center for Education and Research in Neuropsychiatry of the Samara State Medical uh, University, started mental health of general population across 40 countries. We also reviewed existing data on brain imaging uh, of COVID-19 patients. We studied women's mental health and uh, females' vulnerability during uh, pandemic. And um, also we studied the issues of psychopharmacology of our patients who unfortunately caught uh, COVID uh, during this pandemic. So uh, we will move to our speakers and their very interesting talks and I will present all our nine uh, prominent speakers from now on. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce our first prominent speaker, Professor Elias Messialis. Professor Messialis currently works at the London School of Economics and Political Science in the United Kingdom. Um, he's a professor of the Department of Health Policy and the ELSE Health Director. Uh, everyone knows that Professor Elias Marcialis is the former Minister of the State of Greece and now acts uh, at the prestigious and important position of the scientific coordinator of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, guided by Prof. Maria Monti, the prime former Prime Minister of Italy. Um, you know that the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development has been established by the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe and comprising experts from a wide range of backgrounds and across the Pan-European region. And has now, they have now set out an ambitious agenda to achieve health and secure future for everyone, learning lessons from the current pandemic. And it's very important to build a post-pandemic future from now on, in which everyone's health is protected and 
promoted. That's what Professor Elias Marcellus would like to emphasize in his important uh, message to our audience uh, today. Uh, you can actually read uh, in detail um, the recent papers published by Professor Elias Marcellus in the Lancet Journal about vaccines, about uh, uh, health policy across pandemic and about um, health services disruption and uh, management uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the topic of the uh, speech of Professor Elias Marcialis at our symposium is, sounds as drawing light from the COVID-19 pandemic Rethinking Strategies for Health Policy. Uh, welcome, Professor Elias Marcialis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in your very important conference today. Uh, I'm delighted to, to join, and I'm going to speak about the pandemic. What else? Uh, we're living uh, in a very critical moment uh, in the history of public health. And I'm going to focus on the work of the Pan-European Commission, the World Health Organization Pan-European Commission, on addressing the pandemic. This is a commission chaired by former Italian Prime Minister Mario Monti, and I was its scientific coordinator. So the topic of my presentation will be about rethinking strategies for health policy to address future crises and future pandemics. The current pandemic is undoubtedly a catastrophe. It was also, however, preventable. The potential impacts of a novel pathogen were known for many, many years. Scientists and commentators around the world warned of the threat, but there has been no action from international organizations and many powerful governments. We were not ready for COVID-19 and people, economies, and governments around the world have suffered a lot as a result. We must learn from these experiences now and implement transformational changes so that we can prevent future pandemics and crises. And in, if and when emergencies do emerge, we can respond in a more timely, robust, and equitable way and minimize the immediate and long-term consequences of the pandemic and the long-term impacts of these pandemics. In 2021, as I mentioned, the Pan European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, chaired by the former Italian Prime Minister, Mario Monti, assessed the challenges posed by the pandemic in the World Health Organization re European region and the lessons from this response. The commissioners have addressed health in all aspects analyzing the interactions between health and sustainable development. The Commission's final report makes a number of policy recommendations that are evidence-based, evidence-informed, and above all, actionable. So we call on international agencies and organizations uh, and governments, powerful governments, together, act together, coordinate their activities, and address future challenges. So the current pandemic has reinforced existing inequalities and has brought forth new ones between the elderly who could not go outside and the young who were kept inside by government decisions in most countries in Europe, but also beyond Europe. Between professionals who could work from home, they had this possibility through teleworking and factory workers who could not work and were exposed to the pandemic more than those who could stay at home and work from home, between formal workers and the self-employed who lost most of their income, between citizens in rich countries in the north whose governments could borrow their way out of the crisis, out of the pandemic, and those in poor countries which did not have the resources to fight the pandemic. The crisis also revealed how inadequate some healthcare systems are even within the developed world. Countries that are used to being labeled developing or low and middle income countries are watching all these developed economies, including the uh, US, the UK and Italy and their healthcare systems, struggling to contain the pandemic. We see how much a nation's economy depends on the capacity and resilience of 
uh, a healthcare system, a social care system, and the dedication of the workforce within the healthcare system, as well as the supply of vaccines, equipment, and useful medicines. Those who were hit hardly by the pandemic were primarily people with multi-morbidities, the high cost, high need, vulnerable people in our societies. We can see data here from Canada, a little bit of old data. Now, sometimes I tend to present old data in my presentations because we have the knowledge about the vulnerable people in our societies and who these vulnerable people are, but we rarely use this knowledge and the evidence related to vulnerable people and the Marty Moby people. So we know, for example, that 1% of our patients consume 33% of overall healthcare expenditure and 10% of our patients up to 77% of total healthcare expenditure. And these vulnerable multi mobile people were hit, hit very badly by this pandemic. So we have to take care of their needs in a more integrated and better organized healthcare system that will bring together primary care with hospital care and pharmacy care and long-term care and physical health with mental health as well. The pandemic has also reminded us of the limits of our power over nature and of the potential lethal collective effects of misguided individual actions. We know that emissions fell rapidly in lockdown. So what can we do to prevent a climate catastrophe, which could also uh, uh, develop a fertile uh, environment for more pandemics? The economic shock of suspending most manufacturing and transport across the globe is also giving us a sense of what a disorderly transition to net zero will entail. So we have to get our act together and, and, and implement aggressive action uh, in the climate crisis. However, however, we are also faced with an economic crisis these days, and we don't know whether governments will take additional action to prevent the climate crisis, or we we'll invest more only in economic activities, which are not related to protecting the environment and promoting green development. I do hope that they will learn the lessons from this pandemic, and they will also try to tackle climate, uh, the climate crisis. So what did we suggest as a MONDI Commission, as the WHO Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development? Our main suggestion is that we do need to operationalize the concept of one health at all levels. COVID-19 is a tragedy, but we must also use it as an opportunity to re-examine our existing global health architecture and the way it works. From the global to the local level, many current and future threats to health arise at the intersection of human, animal and environmental health, including increasing antimicrobial resistance, another uh, major problem and tragedy that threatens to reverse the achievements of modern medicine. Structures, incentives and a supportive environment are needed to establish cross-government One Health strategies. The ministers of health, the ministers for climate change and environment, the ministers of agriculture will have to work together with the ministers for, ministers for innovation and finance and operationalize a coherent One Health approach. So we do need also to strengthen the global architecture. We need to get the WHO to work together with the Food and Agriculture Organization and the, World, uh, and the UN Nations Environmental Program. If these organizations don't work together, we'll be faced with more problems in the future. We also need to support innovation for our health. We have seen the huge in investments made by governments uh, and the pharmaceutical industry and public-private partnerships to promote the development of new vaccines. We have many vaccines now available uh, in most developed countries. However, there are significant problems in terms of accessing vaccines in low and middle income countries. Less than one third of the global population has been vaccinated, fully vaccinated so far, but less than two or three percent of the population in the low income countries has been vaccinated. So we do need to have new systems of innovation where the risk is not only borne, uh, primarily borne by the private public sector, but it is equally borne by both the public and the private sector, and both sectors reap the benefits in a more equitable way. And the private sector makes commitments to transfer technologies to countries in uh, low and middle income environments so that we can have more availability and higher affordability regarding access to vaccines. 
we also need to create an enabling, enabling environment to promote investment in health. Investments in health may have short-term costs. We know that. In most countries, we're spending 7 to 12% of our gross national product on, on health care. And many ministers of finance um, address the health sector as a cost area. But if we plan well, investments in health often bring higher long-term financial savings and benefits. Past failures to invest in health has, have been fueled by short-termism, vested interests, and failure to recognize the wider benefits that the health systems bring to society. So we cannot afford to continue in this manner with short-termism. We need changes to the information, incentives, and norms that govern the allocation of resources. A clearer distinction should be made between health exposure for consumption and health exposure for investment to prevent diseases and improve the efficient delivery of healthcare systems. At the same time, the economic benefits of better health and improvements in health should be incorporated in microeconomic forecasting and great investments should be made in measures to reduce health threats, provide early warning systems and improve crisis response and also reduce inequalities in our world. Finally, we need to improve health governance at the global level. The COVID-19 catastrophe occurred despite the fact that most nations in the world were states parties to the international health regulations of 2005 and had agreed in principle to combat health threats through joint action, but this has never happened. There is a need to establish now a pandemic treaty, which is truly global. It should include as many countries as possible, be flexible, yet, yet also enforceable, and be feasible in terms of its scope. It needs to incentivize governments and foster willingness to pull sovereign decision making in case of pandemics. We need to act together in the future, not in our individual ways. Too often, scientists, experts, and politicians have said never again, but memories fade. This time, we must learn the lessons of history. No country can do it alone. We need a multilateral rules-based system in which everyone, every country recognizes their interdependence on this small planet and acts accordingly. We should not fail again. Thank you for your attention. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm really delighted to introduce our next speaker, my beloved uh, mentor and teacher, Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis, who is really um, a great leader of, in the world psychiatry. Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis currently acts as the head of the Department of Psychiatry in the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. Uh, Professor Kostas Fontolakis is uh, the World Psychiatric Association uh, representative for Southern Europe and the chair of the section on evidence-based psychiatry and working on the uh, action plan 2020-2023 for the evidence-based uh, psychopharmacology. Also, Professor Kostas Fontolakis works as the head of the director of the Kahara Increase and since 2021 is the World Health Organization representative for Greece as well. Uh, Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis has received a numerous number of awards for his uh, research achievements in uh, bipolar st uh, disorder studies and uh, um, bipolar disorder psychopharmacological uh, treatments and um, you know, was a part of the um, many initiatives of uh, the leading uh, professional associations related to uh, bipolar disorder studies. And during current pandemic, Professor Konstantinos uh, Fontoulakis has managed a, a large um, international research project, which is titled a comment from the abbreviation of the COVID uh, and mental health international study, which covers the 40 countries and uh, uh, was focusing on uh, affective uh, disturbances, I mean, anxiety, depression, as well as uh, the studies of conspiracy beliefs in society. 
uh, in the general population of 40 countries during pandemic and its associated lockdown. So now we welcome Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis to uh, deliver this talk about this uh, very important project. And uh, uh, what is important that Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis will be talking about the Chris study sample, but uh, we'll move to the results of the international study uh, and talking about the anxiety, depression and conspiracy beliefs. Welcome our dear Professor Kostas Fontoulakis to the floor of our symposium on COVID-19 and mental health. Hello everybody. Uh, so I'm going to present the results of a study concerning uh, self-reported changes in anxiety, depression, suicidality, but also the presence of uh, conspiracy beliefs during the COVID-19 lockdown. The COVID-19 outbreak uh, is expected to trigger feelings of fear, worry and stress as responses to an extreme threat for the community and the individual. In addition, changes in social behavior, as well as working conditions, uh, daily habits and routine are expected to impose further stress, uh, especially with the expectation of an ongoing economic crisis uh, and possibly unemployment. According to a previously developed model, the cutoff point of 23-24 was used for the Central for Epidemiological Studies depression scale, uh, and also a previously derived algorithm uh, was used to identify cases of major depression. Uh, those identified by only one of this method, either by the algorithm or by the cutoff, were considered as cases of distress false positive in terms of depression, uh, while those identified by both me uh, methods were considered to be uh, cases of major depression. The data were collected online and anonymously from April 11th to May 1st, 2020, during the period of the full implementation of lockdown in the country. Announcements and advertisements were done in the social media, and through news sites, but no other organized effort uh, had been undertaken. Uh, participants were informed of the existence of the study and the questionnaire through announcements uh, also in uh, news sites. The first page included a declaration of consent, which everybody accepted by continuing uh, the participation. The study sample included uh, 2,756 females, uh, corresponding to 81.08%. Their age was 34 uh, plus minus 9.72 years and 621 males corresponding to 18.27% aged 36.38 plus minus 10.33 years. 22 persons declared other sex that corresponds to 0.64 percent and they were aged 29 uh, plus minus 6.68 years. Uh, the analysis of data utilized two pathways. The first uh, was uh, an epidemiological analysis pathway. Now the problem that we had with the sample was that it was self-selected and as you can see females were overrepresented. so what we did was to utilize a method of uh, somehow simplified post stratification in order to create a standardized study sample with characteristics as close as possible to the greek general population uh, afterwards we had descriptive tables and statistics uh, for the variables under uh, investigation. The second uh, pathway included case control analysis with the use of the original uh, unstandardized raw data set. Uh, for this analysis, we utilized his square test for the comparison of frequencies 
one categorical variance, of course, were present. And for the post FOC analysis, we used the Bonferroni correction, multiple forward. Uh, uh, per stepwise linear regression analysis was also performed with Chefe as the post uh, hoc test and factorial analysis of variance uh, ANOVA was used to test the main effect as well as the interaction among categorical variables. Now, uh, the results of the epidemiological analysis. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of description, one third concerned married cases. The majority, uh, that's 58.01%, were carers of at least one person belonging to a vulnerable population. There was an increased need for communication. More than 40% of people reported that. For emotional support, 24.16%. And uh, a need for improvement of uh, the quality of relationship in something like 25% of uh, responders. Conflicts within the family remain unchanged in comparison to before the lockdown. The exception uh, concerned families with children whose behavior was more difficult to manage than before. So 27.43% of these families had increased conflicts within the family. In the majority of cases, that's interesting, a, a basic daily routine was maintained in 58.13%. Now, concerning mental health, history of any mental disorder was reported by 29.6%, which is a little bit higher than expected, but not dramatically higher. History of depression was the most frequent with 26.92, that's clearly higher than expected. Psychotic disorders were rare, 0.49%, that's lower than expected. Uh, bipolar disorder, 0.12%, and eating disorders, 0.11%. Substance use disorder was very rare, 0.02%. Increased anxiety due to the lockdown was reported by more than 45%, as you can see uh, on the top uh, of this uh, table, 37 plus 8.82, and more depressive feelings uh, by almost 40%, the second uh, red cycle. Suicidal thoughts were increased in 4.42% and decreased in 10.4%, which is interesting. Major depression was present in 9.31% with an additional 8.5% experiencing severe distress. Now, these are higher than expected uh, numbers, maybe double, at least 1.5% times uh, higher, uh, probably double what's expected. Now, thoughts pertaining to the COVID outbreak uh, that uh, prophylactic measures indeed work were believed by 84.14% uh, and more than um, 95% followed them at least to a moderate degree. Almost 80% um, obeyed to at least a large extent to the lockdown rules. More than 80% were feeling that the situation was very stressful. More than 95% feel that there was enough information concerning uh, the necessity of measures. Now, if you look at the circles of this, the red circles of this slide, you will see that only Less than 10% was afraid much or very much that they will get the COVID. Interestingly, when you see the second circle, you see that almost half were afraid that a family member will do. Now, note the contrast between fears for myself and fears for my family. This is a very interesting, um, very interesting finding uh, that will contribute to the model 
uh, which uh, we were able to derive later. Now, these, these things here mean that maybe uh, more stressed were not those living alone, uh, having no family, no, no, no support, but on the contrary, there were those people within a family and the social support environment who had some kind of responsibility uh, and care for their family. Um, eventually, you can see that uh, uh, at the bottom line, uh, more than uh, almost 80% uh, believe that was believing that uh, they were following adequately uh, the measures, uh, the precautionary and uh, protective measures. What about believing in conspiracy theories? Now, this is interesting. It is more or less in accord with the literature. We should always uh, be careful to interpret these findings because, as said, the original population was self-selected. Probably it had higher rates for a history of any mental disorder. Yes, we did a post-stratification of the study sample, but still you can never be sure whether this reflects what is happening in the general population. But what we have, we do have from other studies and from surveys of the general population, we believe that more or less this is the, the true picture in the general population. Now you can see that the more the bizarre one conspiracy theory, for example, in the bottom you see, do you believe that COVID-19 is a sign of divine power to destroy the planet. That's a little bit over 10%. Uh, when you go to, do you believe that COVID-19 is the result of 5G technology, which is also bizarre, a little bit more than 20%. It's less than a divine power, but still it's bizarre. Now, when you go to, uh, do you believe that it was created in a laboratory, or uh, the mortality rate is lower than uh, what the media say, you have more than 50% of people believing that conspiracy theory. They are the majority in the population, which is very, very annoying and very, very uh, alarming. Although, as said, I would, I would be very cautious to interpret in practical terms uh, what, uh, what this means. After all, after all, 80 or 90 percent conformed with the with 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 the measures uh, recommended so yes people probably think a lot but do far less these things now if we go to the case analysis the, the analysis of the raw data set on the basis of cases and uh, we utilize his square uh, multiple linear regression analysis uh, etc. You find that some, some factors seem to be risk factors for the development of depression. For example, younger age, general health status, previous history of depression, of course, previous history of self-harm, of course, and suicidal attempts, family responsibility, that's interesting. When there is a family support system and family responsibility, then it increases concern because you are anxious and you are afraid that one of your uh, loved ones will, uh, will die, will uh, lose him. And of course, economic change, that's reasonable. On the other hand, there are some factors that could act as protective factors, like keeping a daily routine, uh, pursuing religious and spirituality, that's interesting, but expected. What's very, very interesting is that Believing in conspiracy theories could act as, as, as a protective factor against the development of depression. That's very important. That's novel. Uh, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, uh, it's uh, there is not in the literature. And if I would like to be some uh, to to have a, uh, a cultural um, philosophical. Uh, Sent, I would say that this is uh, where uh, Zampol Sartre is justified. You know that Zampol Sartre said in the existentialist said that schizophrenia, madness, is uh, the ultimate act of freedom because with madness uh, the person rejects 
an unbearable reality of the real world and uh, creates <coughs> his own free world. <coughs> now, this is probably not uh, correct for schizophrenia and mental illness in general, but here, with conspiracy theories, it could be a reasonable explanation that people are so much afraid and so much depressed that uh, changing reality constitutes a coping defense mechanism against this unbearable reality. Just, just a philosophical sense, as I said, we, we, we need far, far uh, much more research to, uh, to confirm this fact. Furthermore, if we consider this previous uh, cyclic model in a more or less linear continuum from fear, stress, to anxiety, to depressive emotions, to clinical depression, and eventually to suicidality, the model which can be derived suggests that there is a core of variables exerting uh, a generic stressful effect leading to simple thoughts and feelings of fear, of course, after the insult of the COVID-19 outbreak. At the second level, at the second step, the development of anxiety is determined by a number of social and interpersonal variables, including the quality of relationships with the family, keeping a basic daily routine, change in economic situation and history of deliberate self-harm and being afraid that the family member will get COVID-19 and die. Now, interestingly, all of these variables are social interpersonal, including history of self-harm. They also suggest that the fear of losing the supporting environment is stronger than the support by the environment itself in those patients who go on to develop anxiety. Fear of losing is stronger than the support the environment gives. At the next step, the restriction of time outside the house because of the lockdown uh, led to the development of depressive feelings, while the additional presence of history of suicidal attempts loads more the person, especially in younger individuals. Age plays a crucial role here. Uh, this constitutes an additional risk factor in developing clinical depression. Eventually, you have spiritual and religious uh, beliefs uh, and affiliation that could protect the individual from the emerging suicidal thoughts. Now, the results regarding the beliefs in conspiracy theories showed that the latter were related to the presence of depression or distress, but not to past history of depression or suicidality. So it's here and now. And how does this derive? Correlation does not imply causation. So we, we had the uh, result of uh, the statistical result of correlation, but how can you say that this is a causal relationship? Okay, after taking into consideration that also uh, in the family environment, the expression of anger seems to be a protective factor, we propose that the beliefs are a coping mechanism against the emergence of depression, not a consequence of stress. Um, interestingly, also beliefs specifically concerning uh, the COVID, some at, at, at a certain extent influence adherent, adherence to measures. Um, so by adding also uh, conspiracy beliefs in this stress uh, diathesis uh, and outcome model uh, leads to a model of uh, what we would say of multiple vulnerabilities and uh, dysfunctional coping uh, and this is what you can see in this very complex slide and of course remember stay safe and keep your distance Uh, dear colleagues, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Marcus Olmi, who has recently been working 
at the Department of Neuroscience in Padua University in Italy and now moved to Canada and working at the Department of Psychiatry of the prestigious University of Ottawa in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Associate Professor Marcus Holmey uh, has published more than 200 papers and one of the leaders in publishing in the evidence-based psychopharmacology and his uh, main clinical areas of interest are prevention, early intervention in psychiatry, comorbidity between mental and medical disorders and of course approach to evidence-based psychopharmacology. Uh, Professor Solme is an expert in uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis approach to uh, data analysis. And one of the recent, main recent achievements of Professor Marco Solme is uh, the management of the large international project about uh, uh, health and functioning during infection times together with Professor Christoph Coral from Germany they coordinate the COVID famous project which is the abbreviation for the collaborative outcome study on health and functioning during infection times and today Professor Marcus Somi will be talking about the design and preliminary results from uh, over 150,000 participants from all over the world. So this is the uh, very important um, and uh, one of uh, um, the unique uh, um, uh, international projects related to the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on the health of general population. We are happy to have Associate Professor Marco Salmi together with us and we are happy to listen to the results of this important project. Good morning to everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Marco Solmi. I'm Associate Professor at Psychiatry Department, University of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I would like to thank the organizational committee of the um, conference and I'm here today to share some of the preliminary global findings from the COVID study. This is my disclosure. What is the COVID study? The COVID study, which stands for Collaborative Outcome Study on Health and Functioning During Infection Times, is an online survey that is completely anonymous and that has been translated on as many as 30 languages. All the languages version of the survey itself are available at the Beating Heart, the hub of the COVID study, which is the website uh, coh-fit.com. And I invite you all to go there and participate to the survey, also to experience uh, uh, hands-on what the COVID study is about. What we are aiming to do with the COVID study is to assess how people have been impacted on their health and functioning and a number of outcomes uh, uh, by the pandemic of COVID-19. We are doing this by asking people how they have been feeling during the last two weeks when they respond to the survey and then how they have been feeling on the very same outcome the last two weeks of their, let's say, uh, regular life before the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. And by measuring the change, of course, with a retrospective design, we're expecting to be able to measure how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted people's lives. COVID study is a large initiative. Um, it has included so far over 230 researchers from over 40 countries across the globe. And it has started in April 2020 um, by me and uh, Professor Christoph Corral. We are both co-PIs of the COVID study. And then we have been so lucky to have many uh, world-class researchers 
joining the initiatives and helping uh, proactively in each country collecting data. The COVID study has been supported by several scientific and professional associations. In particular, I would like to mention the ECMP Prevention Mental Disorders and Mental Health Promotion Thematic Working Group, as well as the European Psychiatric Association and World Psychiatric the World Association of Social Psychiatry, as well as other national and international associations. These are some of the results, some numbers from the study. You can see that so far we have been able to collect over 150,000. Well, actually, um, the numbers are even higher right now. This might be uh, from a week ago, around a week ago. So 150,000 uh, responses from 155 countries from all the continents. What you can find in the website is an interactive platform where you can um, navigate with your mouse and you can play around just taking a look for the sake of curiosity how the COVID study has been collecting data across the whole continents, including, let's say, some details uh, for each and every country regarding how many participants. You can see here Italy, of course, because that's uh, my uh, country of origin, let's say, um, uh, has collected over 13,000 responses. And you can see here from the details that we have been collecting both non-representative adults and representative adults, and also non-representative children and adolescents, as well as uh, uh, the representative children and adolescents. And so this um, brings on the table two more information on um, the COVID study, which are that the COVID study is aiming to collect responses from both adults children adolescents so no age restrictions um and then also that we have been uh, adjusting for the of course selection bias that um is unavoidable in online surveys because online surveys are responded by people that access to uh, the web and that have uh, some sort of uh, web literacy let's say uh, we have adjusted those estimates by uh, hiring polling agencies that have collected representative samples by age, job status, and education across many countries. You can see here around 26, now even more, uh, thousands participants in representative samples and from many countries in adults and also many countries for children and adolescents. We believe that this is a strength of the study because it provides um, an objective measure um, of, um, let's say, some generalizable results as opposed to uh, selected samples that might be too highly educated and too young compared with the general population uh, if we did not adjust for the representative samples. The general aim, as I told you, is to assess how physical and mental well-being of children, adolescents, and also of adults have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the general structure of the survey. You can see from the left that, of course, an adult always has to consent to participate to the study, and then the adult can take the survey, uh, him or herself, on the left hand of the slide, and then the adult can also give the consent for his kids, for adolescents to participate. And then again, the adult will do a parental rating of how their kids and adolescents are doing. And then the kids and adolescents will also be able to give their assent at this point to participate to the study and go through the self rating. So the real questionnaires themselves as well. At the end, you can see that we have also envisioned to um, add some validation instrument. This is important because for the sake of, um, you know, broadness, um, we have sacrificed validated questionnaires and we have only used selected items from validated questionnaires to assess this or that mental health outcomes. So let's say, for instance, that for depression, we did not use the all, all the nine PHQ items, but we only extracted two um, items which we think 
other core items to measure depressive symptoms. Then, of course, this is a critical decision. So we have uh, made sure to um, measure the validity of our decision. And we have also now completed the validation analysis. We show that there is a solid correlation above 0.5 uh, between the COVID items and the full validated questionnaires. This is the variable universe, we can call it, of the COVID study. You can see on the top left, there are no modifiable factors. Uh, what are these factors? These factors are useful to identify people at risk of developing poor outcome during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this might indicate where resources should be allocated, and so which strata of the population should be protected the most during the pandemic. On the top right, you can see the modifiable factors, and those are a number of factors that can be seen as actionable items. So from stakeholders, policymakers, and clinicians as well, um, they are items, there are they are variables that could be targeted from preventive interventions, but also from uh, interventions after uh, the esoteric outcome uh, is uh, developed. Then what will we do with these uh, variables? We will put them into correlation with our outcomes. We have two co-primary outcomes. One is uh, well-being measured with the WHO5. And uh, another one is uh, something that we uh, will create uh, that is a composite psychopathology score that will be made, will be composed by um, several items measuring individual psychopathology domains. We think that this is of great value because people can do can be unwell from a mental health standpoint for several reasons and just focusing on one specific outcome we don't think really gives us the picture of how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the general population mental health. We have gone be beyond uh, health and functioning. We have also assessed functioning of uh, healthcare services. You can see here, we have measured how people felt, how easy they felt it was accessing to care for physical health before and after the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see that overall before COVID-19 pandemic, they have rated um, around 90% easy to access to care um, while you can see that after or during after the after the outbreak, so during the COVID nineteen pandemic, they have rated the easiness of access to care for physical health around fifty. So there is there has been a huge drop in easiness of access to care for physical health, and um, this is also a clinical experience, I have to say, because all the hospitals have been shifting their resources uh, for the COVID nineteen pandemic uh, care. And people with chronic conditions, such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, but any other type of chronic physical condition, and also now we'll see in a bit uh, mental uh, disorders, they have been, I would say, neglected by the healthcare uh, services during the last over a year now. You can see that healthcare services, however, have been trying to shift their modality of delivery of care. Uh, but this might have just not been enough for physical care because, of course, um, patients have to be seen in person. What about mental health care? Again, uh, it has been disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but you can see that here the impact has been uh, definitely smaller. Um, and uh, you can see that it has dropped from, again, around 90 to around 70. So let's say, around 20 percentage points better than or less bad, let's say, than uh, what happened for physical healthcare services. And <clears throat> this might have um, been due to the fact that you can see uh, video call and phone um, delivery uh, modality has uh, hugely increased. And of course, for mental disorders, um, this is more uh, sustainable and more, more clinically valid and safe um, than what it can be for uh, physical disorders. Mental healthcare services might have been able to cope 
better than physical health services to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is, I think, good news as a psychiatrist um, because it means that we have been creative and uh, uh, flexible and resilient enough to keep helping our patients. What are the coping strategies that have been uh, put in place by the general population and also what are, what are those that are deemed most important by the general population? You can see here, uh, starting from the left, uh, being able to browse the web is of course of great help because it keeps people busy and it keeps people curious and they can still, you know, um, dedicate time to their interests and uh, also be in contact with uh, peers. And uh, another very important coping strategy is exercise that's good for mental and physical health. This is uh, now well established. And so it should not be, I think, um, prohibited during the pandemic, of course, regarding those activities that can be do, that can be done not in the in closed spaces where, where is, of course, the risk of spreading the infection, but in open spaces, it could be considered a good thing. Again, keeping contacts. This is not only in person, but also via uh, the web and video uh, conferences and meetings is, of course, a coping strategies that people have felt uh, to be helpful during the pandemic. This is um, the same, but from children. You can see in particular here, of course, direct social contact, but also exercise and internet use keep being the three more important coping strategies. And you can see here for adolescents, again, internet and exercise are and social media and also direct social contact. So again, the web exercise and social contacts are the most important coping strategies. Here's some measure of how the COVID um, has quantified the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on emotions of adults. You can see there is uh, around 30 point percentage point increase in this relevant uh, emotional domains, including stress, frustration, boredom, helplessness, cognition, measured by the ability to focus, anger, and loneliness. We know that stress in particular are all uh, relevant outcomes that can affect both um, physical and mental health. And so this is, of, of course, of great concern. And the same has happened for children with even definitely higher uh, worsening. So here we're talking about um, 40 percentage points of worsening with really clinically relevant and again, for adolescents, the same. This is the WHO5, which is our um, primary outcome. And you can see just five easy questions to measure well-being. And you can see here the measure of how well-being has worsened during the pandemic. And in particular, I would like to point your attention to the two, to the couple of parts on the right. You can see that the percentage of people scoring less than 60 out of 100, the WHO5 has increased by 20 percentage points, which is, of course, again, of, I think, public health concern. For children, the numbers are even higher. So the delta during the pandemic has been even more relevant and also for adolescents. Quality of life has also been impacted by the pandemic. And again, we're talking about children and adolescents here. You can see that these results kind of replicate what WHO5 has just shown. Then again, on the right, the functioning of children and adolescents, and this is a parental rating, so this is not self-rating, but rated by their parent, has also shown concerning worsening. I would like to mention that this is of particular concern because these are data from a large meta-analysis that we just published on molecular psychiatry. You can see that the proportion of um, people uh, developing mental disorders as a peak are at age 14 to 15. So these are apparently, according to our data, 
the population strata that have been more badly hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, we should, of course, dedicate efforts for prevention of mental disorders and strictly monitoring our youth uh, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has some more details on the age at onset of mental disorders. So in conclusion, exercise should be allowed according to our results, because of course, if it's safe, if it's in a safe environment, an open environment, uh, it can definitely help the mental health of people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, social contacts are also important, so schools where safe might be might not be closed. And also social contacts, even via video calls, should also be promoted in adolescents. And this is, um, I think, also a suggestion for schools where a group works, group learning, group um, homework might be definitely incentivated to keep our adolescents connected to one each other. Stress has substantially increased. Cognition has never been negatively impacted during the pandemic. And again, we've been taking this into account for our uh, youth that is going through their learning curve and their learning academic um, uh, career. So this is definitely an important uh, thing. Again, anger, frustration, and um, uh, loneliness have all increased. And again, of great concern, uh, well-being as around below 60, so clinically relevant, has around uh, has, have, has had an increase of around 100%, so has doubled. And again, quality of life, the same and functioning the same. So um, let's keep monitoring. The message that I would like to share is let's keep monitoring our youth in particular and the fragile populations that are uh, more prone to developing bad health outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, I invite you all to please go to the website cohfit.com and please take the survey, share, because every response counts to generate evidence and help the general population um, being helped with evidence-based policies by our stakeholders. Thank you again for the attention. Dear colleagues, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, amazing Professor Florence Tipot, who currently works at the uh, Paris Descartes University and Hospital Coach in Paris, in Paris, France. Uh, Professor Florence Tipot is an expert in psychiatry and also an expert in endocrinology and has a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, Professor Florence Tipot acted as the president of the French Association for Biological Psychiatry and she is also a past president of the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry. Now Professor Florence Thibault also uh, works as the president of Association of Women's Mental Health focusing on uh, defense of the women's right and the uh, rights of the female patients with mental disorders as well as the very important uh, issues of violence against uh, women in family with uh, life and intimate partners in um, working conditions at workplace and as well as um, in society in general. Uh, all of us know that the female gender has been estimated uh, as a risk factor as associated with the long COVID and also mental uh, disturbances related to COVID-19 infection and uh, um, uh, caused by the um, lockdown conditions and social isolation measures. So we're very curious to listen to the lecture of Professor Florence Thibault about women's mental health and COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for agreement to be with us. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Thibault from the University of Paris, France, and I will talk about COVID and the consequences on women's mental health. I'm the current president of the International Association of Women's Mental Health. My disclosures. <clears throat> 
So we talk about the mortality rate, the long COVID, the psychological risk in women associated to COVID, the risk of violence, and then a few words of conclusion. About the mortality rate, there are some gender differences. If you look at a recent review, um, I think it was from um, the uh, WHO, but I, I'm not completely sure. So for every 10 female, there were eight male tests. And for 10 female, there were 10 male cases, 11 male hospitalization, and 18 male admission in intensive care units, and finally, 13 male death. And when you compare for vaccination, for every 10 female with vaccination, there are only nine male vaccination. So uh, women and, male, and, and males can catch COVID-19, but the mortality rate is higher in males and the admission in intensive care unit is also higher in males as compared to females. This death ratio is partly explained by pre-existing cardiovascular and metabolic risk, which is currently higher in men, but, but women are um, increasing their cardiovascular and metabolic risk uh, too with uh, because of different um, factors. Uh, there is a higher prevalence of alcohol and tobacco use in men until now, but the prevalence of alcohol and tobacco use is unfortunately increasing also in women, especially in Western countries. There is less compliance with sanitation measures in men in general. And finally, there are hormonal and genetic differences, of course, be between men and women. And on chromosome X, there are some genes involved in the immune system. So as you know, females have uh, two chromosome X, and usually one is inactivated. But in the case of the immune system, both are activated. So that means in general that females are um, better as compared to males uh, in case of infectious disease, so their immune system is functioning better. But unfortunately, it's so in some cases functioning too much so that they can have immune diseases. What are the gender differences in terms of long COVID-19, which is uh, now described all around the world, including in children? So long COVID is defined by um, uh, COVID, uh, which is lasting more than uh, uh, 12 weeks and uh, up to six months. And there are different symptoms, including fatigue, declining quality of life, muscular weakness, joint pain, dyspnea, cough, persistent oxygen requirement, unfortunately not very often, and some psychological uh, uh, symptoms such as anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, PTSD, cognitive disturbances described by our English colleague as brain fog, headaches, palpitation, chest pain, thromboembolism, chronic kidney disease, and finally, hair loss. And this might be associated to cellular damage or a robust response with inflammatory cytokines, which is in use by the infection. And both factors may contribute to long COVID. Um, some recent papers have identified some vascular risk in order to explain uh, some uh, pulmonary symptoms in, in uh, long COVID patients. What are the risk factors for long COVID? Severity of acute COVID, of course, pre-existing respiratory disease, higher BMI, older age, uh, more than 60 or 70 years old, ethnic minority, and of course, female gender. Females have a higher risk of fatigue, anxiety, depression at six months. They have an odd ratio of 2.2 for diffusion impairment, which means probably uh, lung dysfunction, of 1.8 for anxiety or depression post-COVID, and 1.3 for fatigue or muscular weakness compared with men, respectively, after COVID. So, 
in, in summary, they have a higher risk of long COVID, mainly for psychological and pulmonary uh, symptoms. COVID-19 and psychological risk in women. In the general population, uh, there might be, but this is not replicated by all studies, a, a higher risk of anxiety and depression during the pandemic, independently of COVID infection. So regardless of COVID, there is in general a higher risk of psychological symptoms in women. women. And an online study was conducted in the general population by Ipsos um, in eight countries for uh, an insurance company. France, Germany, Italy, Spain, UK, Mexico, Nigeria, Thailand. That was conducted in October 2020 after the, the huge peak of the pandemic in March 2020 in a representative sample of more than 8,000 women aged than more than 18 years old. And they have shown that um, there were a lot of symptoms that started or worsened during pandemics, such as, for example, being worried, anxious, feeling down or discouraged, lacking energy, having trouble to sleep, feeling lonely, feeling depressed, being overweight, experiencing colds, feeling pain, some addiction and chronic diseases. And in red, yes, it started during the pandemic. And yes, it started before or worsened during the pandemic. So you can see that in, in one quarter, in 10% to one quarter of the population, these symptoms started or worsened during the pandemic in females. And this was specially observed in Mexico, Niger Nigeria, UK, Spain, Italy, and to a lesser extent in France and, and Germany. In the UK, a sample of more than 15,000 people were um, supposed to answer an online questionnaire, and um, around 30% of them had higher scores of, for psychiatric symptoms, and more than one third felt lonely. And again, that was the case, especially in single women, young people, and those who have had COVID. That was in the general population. In the US, in the general population, uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic, there were higher scores of depression, anxiety, almost half of the population, PTSD, one third of the population, in about 900 Americans from 18 to 30 years old during the pandemic. But in this study, they found no gender differences in terms of scores of depression, anxiety, and PTSD in the general population during the pandemic. PTSD was also observed in 7% 7 of uh, the general population in Wuhan, China, one month after the peak of the pandemic. And again, there was a higher, a higher rate of PTSD in females as compared to males in the general population during the pandemic. There was also higher vulnerability to psychiatric symptoms in women at work during the pandemic. We have to say that women were most of the frontline health workers, such as nurses, midwives, pharmacies, social workers. They represented 70 to 78 percent of frontline health workers. So they were at higher risk just because they were frontline health workers. In Italy and Spain, respectively, 66 and 72 percent of health workers who were COVID positive were women as compared to only 34 and 28 percent of men. Most of the service tasks were also women, cleaning, laundry, uh, helping in canteens, etc. So in general, women were therefore more exposed to the virus just because they were frontline workers. Well, well was there any higher risk of um, psychological symptoms in these women at work? Uh, the answer is mostly yes. There was a higher risk of PTSD, 
depression, anxiety, and burnout during and after the pandemic in these women workers. In China, they have conducted a cross-sectional study in 1,200 Chinese health workers exposed to COVID. Most of them are women, and 60% of them were nurses. Half of them had symptoms of depression, anxiety, and or insomnia, and more than 70% of them had symptoms of stress. The risk factors for having these symptoms were female and being an intermediate worker. In Singapore and India, in 900 healthcare professionals, most of them were women, there was a lower risk of moderate or severe depression, 5%, 8.7% risk of, uh, percentage of moderate or severe anxiety, and, and uh, about 4% of risk of moderate or severe stress. The most, um, obs the most often symptoms observed was headache in 30% uh, of cases which means that probably headache was sort of symptom of anxiety or sub-depression in, in these people, but there were no gender differences. The risk factors for having these factors were living alone, having a low income, and being, having been exposed to COVID, which multiplied by two, three, the risk of having um, um, psychological symptoms. In comparison, 10 to 40% of about 600 healthcare professionals experienced PTSD during the three years after another big pandemic, which was the SARS observed in uh, Eastern countries in 2003. So this is not um, specific to COVID, but this is more related to pandemics in, in general. There was also a lack of psychological care in most health workers. Healthcare professionals had a high workload, isolation, discrimination during the pandemic, and insufficient specialized services to detect and manage anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and to give advice to health workers without stigmatization. This had a little bit improved, especially in France, where I can watch it, but um, there are still um, some progress to do. What about psychological and, and psychiatric disorders observed in those who are COVID positive? <clears throat> COVID positive patients, as compared to, to COVID negative patients, had more symptoms of anxiety and depression. Women had more perceived helpness, which was uh, relatively specific um, in women. And there was a correlation between depression <clears throat> and inflammation especially when you look at the CRPC reactive protein uh, levels. Many patients complain of intense fatigue, apathy during the weeks of months following any viral infection that might be observed with influenza, with the SARS. So this kind of inflammation and, and depressive symptoms are associated to inflammation, positive function, and may, may not be uh, specific to COVID infection. What about the risk of violence uh, in women? Violence against women, mainly in relationship with their intimate partners, increased by 25 to 30% during, during the COVID uh, pandemic, but in, in general during pandemics or uh, catastrophes. Uh, the, the violence observed during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, was more complex because uh, this pandemic prevented women from excessive health or social services. Most of them were closed. They, were, they, were, they had an inability to fly or call social services. And in some cases, COVID was the threat. Uh, to um, threaten women to put them on the streets without any shelter. Women were also um, exposed to more sexual harassment, more online bullying and harassment in, in general. There were some risk factors observed in all victims, such as low income, social isolation, past history of violence during childhood, narrow housing, 
loss of loved ones, fear of dying, which was specific to COVID, difficulty in accessing social and health services, especially during the lockdown periods, which were quite long, we at least two months in, uh, or more in certain countries, inability to fly, increased use of illicit substances, especially in their partners. But there were risk factors related to pandemic itself, such as increased domestic workload, reduced mobilization of specialized services, most of them are closed during the lockdown, lack of emotional support and help, and reduced functioning of justice services, imprisonment, etc., etc. Some uh, prisoners were uh, even released during the pandemic uh, because the pandemic was also high in, in prisons. There were more excuses for male partner aggressiveness. Male aggression with or without alcohol is often excused, especially during pandemic, and especially if the perpetrator apologizes for it. Male violence seems even normal, normal in crisis situations, and women are often accused of overreacting or their calls for help are just ignored in some situations. There are different examples of fights against violence in China, Spain, France, UK, uh, where many people such as pharmacists, uh, people in supermarkets, postmen, deliverymen were caught to uh, be able to alert, were asked to alert the police in case of uh, risk of violence uh, against women. And there were also hotlines uh, and different things like that uh, in different countries. There, were also, there was also an increased risk of aggression against female caregivers, which was observed in, in China, Italy, France, and, and Singapore, among other countries. Increased risk of verbal as well as physical aggression. In conclusion, according to the United Nations, um, after the pandemic, women, especially those aged from 24 to 34, have a 20% increased risk compared to men of being in situation of extreme poverty. So they made some proposals such as increased studies on gender difference. And this is especially the case for COVID because as you know, um, the, the side effects associated to vaccination were mostly observed in females, for example, probably because of uh, an increased um, um, reaction of the immune system in women as compared to men. Include women in political decision-making bodies during pandemic. This was not very often the case. Better recognition of women's social status and the fact that most of them were frontline health workers uh, with intermediate um, uh, jobs, increase and, and not um, a high income, increase social protection of women, especially in, in, in the future and after the pandemic. But this crisis might be an opportunity for women. If we consider the example of the First World War, where black women nurses were able to join the US military for the first time, just because they were lacking nurses. So this um, pandemic was um, at higher risk for psychiatric and psychological symptoms in women, especially those that were um, in, uh, frontline workers. But this can be also an opportunity for women to make uh, to have an imp uh, most more important role, especially in political decision making. Uh, after the pandemic, at least we hope so. And we invite you to participate in our next World Congress on Women's Mental Health, the ninth one, which will be held in Maastricht, the Netherlands, from 7th to 10th, November 2022. So thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you there. Uh, dear professors, dear colleagues, it's my great honor and real pleasure to introduce our next speaker, my dear friend and uh, collaborator, Professor Paul Cumming. 
Professor Paul Kamen is originally from Canada and um, he studied neuroscience, uh, psychopharmacology and brain imaging. Professor Paul Cumming currently works as the professor of the Department of Nuclear Medicine in the University of Bern in Switzerland. He has been working in prestigious universities such as Ludwig Maximilians University in uh, Munich, Queensland University of Technology in um, Australia. And uh, one of the great achievements of Professor Paul Cumming is his book published by the Cambridge University um, press and uh, devoted to the imaging studies of dopamine and what is interesting that Professor Paul Cumming often calls himself as a red doctor because he works with animals models and uh, uh, in uh, dopamine and narrow imaging uh, studies. Uh, today Professor Paul Cumming will deliver a lecture as uh, the team has published an extending and uh, amazing review about imaging findings in COVID-19. And today, Professor Paul Cumming will share the most recent knowledge about brain imaging and neuroimaging findings in COVID-19. Thank you very much for being with us, dear Professor Paul Cumming. Thank you. Well, good morning or afternoon, as the case may be. I'm a neuropharmacologist or receptor pharmacologist, but I've been involved in brain imaging for some time. And therefore I was asked to give this little presentation on uh, summarizing the sorts of brain imaging findings that have been found in COVID-19 cases. Now, um, the main symptoms of COVID-19, as you know, call for the focus of uh, radiological investigations on the lungs where the major and life-threatening symptoms usually present, but COVID-19 19 is a systemic disease and many organ systems are involved and uh, to some extent damaged uh, in patients who survive the, uh, the disease. And in fact, this was the topic of a, a recent review that emanated from the University of Bern, nuclear medicine and radiology departments. You can see the gangs all there, everybody. And uh, it was an attempt to assemble together all that was known, I guess about uh, four or five months ago, about the, the various uh, systemic uh, manifestations of COVID-19, which involve notably the lungs, of course, but also the heart, skeletal muscle, kidney, vasculitis, and the brain. A relatively small part, if you consider all of the brain studies, but uh, I think we will agree on an important uh, aspect of the pathology and uh, symptomatology of uh, COVID-19. And in this paper, um, we summarized uh, from all the different channels of information that uh, were available then. Um, and here was a representative figure from that, uh, from that article showing a case study of a male patient with, as you can see, rather severe uh, pneumonia to CT with, uh, 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 I guess the yellow arrows indicate what's called the ground glass sign, which is an uh, indication of uh, severity of the infection and uh, I guess some lymph node involvement here. Um, and in this uh, second picture, um, the same person really uh, was investigated using a multimodal imaging with CT, but also positron emission tomography, which is more the um, department of nuclear medicine departments. Although, of course, we have hybrid images, imagers that obtain both at once. And you see superimposed upon the CT result is the yellow colored um, uh, regions of high F FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose uptake. And uh, they show the metabolic abnormality that's confined to some zones of the um, infected lung, uh, I guess, in particular to a, ly a lymphatic uh, indication of lymphatic involvement uh, in this disease case. Now, what is this FDG, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose? It's the most widely used tracer, and I'm almost the first pet tracer to this, and to this day, the most widely used tracer for uh, clinical investigations by positron emission tomography. And it is just a glucose molecule, the oxyglucose, modified by the addition of an F fluorine into its ring, which of course is not part of natural glucose. And this particular isotope of fluorine, 18, unlike the natural F fluorine, which has 19 uh, atomic weight, is neutron deficient and is um, unstable. 
This means that wherever the F18 goes, wherever the F fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG molecule goes in the body, it carries with it that radioactivity and the ticking clock of a radioactive decay where it will spontaneously decay with a half-life of about two hours, a physical half-life, um, to release a E plus, which is an antimatter electron or a positron. And if that happens in the medium of the brain, the positron doesn't go far, maybe a millimeter, before it encounters, encounters its, uh, for us, normal matter uh, negative electron, and they annihilate each other. And all the energy that was bound up in that positron electron pair, E equals mc square, is released in a flash of light. Well, not quite true. It's released as two photons of gamma energy, of gamma energy 500 electron, electron kiloelectron volts, which represents the rest mass energy of the electron positron pair. And those two photons, you could say, or gamma energy photons, then um, uh, travel away from each other at the speed of the light, of light go at one going to the left and one going to the right. And here in this old, old photograph, uh, I, I can't remember where this comes from, but it's clearly one of the first PET scanners. You see the person sitting comfortably in a chair, and they're, uh, but uncomfortably having a metal ring around their head that carries with it a number of uh, detectors, which are photoelectron multipliers. Now, if a decay event releases two gamma photons at the same moment, they go apart at 180 degrees, and if they happen to be lucky to encounter two detectors that go off in the same instant, that counts as a decay event somewhere along that uh, vector. And by counting millions of those, you can produce a picture showing the distribution of radioactivity, in this case, the accumulation of the glucose tracer, FDG. Uh, as you can see, the old fashioned uh, prototype scanner had uh, bare naked wires, and that would be considered unsafe and unattractive now. But another key difference is that inside the the, 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 the uh, scanner, there are thousands of detectors. The more detectors and the smaller they are, the better the image. So that's more or less what a, uh, a Siemens biograph uh, is a good representation of a popular at CT. Now, um, excuse me, that was my cat. Um, and uh, since you are clinicians, you will appreciate that one of the main uses of FTG, of FTG PET is for clinical oncology. And here we see the massive uptake in um, uh, uh, lymphoma tumors. And you also see, sort of, uh, without uh, they didn't weren't focusing on it, but uh, because they weren't interested in that uh, um, in the brain, in that particular clinical study, you see that the brain has very high uptake, which is indicative of its very uh, greedy consumption of natural glucose. And uh, so. Um, this presents, introduces the topic really finally of doing brain imaging in patients with COVID or who have recovered from COVID-19. So as, I, as I've said, the, uh, the main manifestations of the illness are in the periphery, but the virus itself is neurotrophic. It enters cells, potentially all cells that, that express the AC2 receptors. That includes neurons. So there's a growing appreciation of the central nervous system manifestations of the infection. And FDG PET has proven to be a very useful uh, technique for examining um, people with uh, uh, especially long COVID, where there's the worrisome persistence of kind of vague uh, asthenia uh, and fatigue symptoms that sound like a post viral uh, encephalitis. Um, and here, this image summarizes the results of that study that was uh, done with 44 cases. So we don't see an individual person here, but we see the average FDG uptake uh, abnormality in um, 44 subjects registered and uh, it's placed upon uh, a kind of a standard brain, which is depicted in silver. And you see that there are zones where there is hypometabolism in, in the population of 44 COVID survivors, uh, notably the orbital frontal co cortex, the right uh, temporal lobe, I'm not sure why it's on the right side and definitely not on the left side, but the fact that this is 44 cases combined, averaged, means that it's highly significant and may have some functional consequences. The hottest spot, which is the coolest brain region, that is with low, the greatest defect in metabolism, is in the pons, 
that is worrisome um, given the role of the pons in the, the particular activation of the brain. So one might suppose that the uh, persistence of uh, hypometabolism in the pons could predict for uh, uh, impairment of consciousness in the long term. And there's also a fairly consistent finding of hypermetabolism in the cerebellum. I don't know what that means. Um, so increasingly, there are people are worried about the, the pediatric manifestations of COVID. And here's another study, very recent, um, in which uh, uh, FTG PET recordings were obtained in a small series of pediatric cases. And they see presented a different way, but uh, the same concept, the areas in which there's hypometabolism in this group of seven kids projected upon their average brain. And you see that it includes the pons, the um, part of the orbital front, frontal cortex and these kind of temporal structures. It happens to be bilateral in these seven kids, whereas it's clearly the temporal uh, hypometabolism is unilateral on the right side. I don't know what that means. They didn't really comment on it, but should uh, not take it for granted that there's always this uh, asymmetric involvement of the disease. Indeed, it's not clear to me why, if this is a consequence of a viral infection entering the brain, which is an assumption, why it should be asymmetric. You would think that the virus making its way presumably through the, uh, the crib cribriform plate into the brain would spread equally to the left and right hemisphere. It may not be that process. It may be uh, another uh, 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 consequence of uh, unrelated to the viral infection of the brain per se. Anyway, um, it's now time to present the paper coming from, uh, um, from Russia, which uh, presents a, a case study of two kids, young adoles adolescent boys from uh, Kazakhstan, who uh, presented with um, sudden onset of uh, catatonia syndrome in conjunction with positivity for COVID-19. However, I must uh, specify that they didn't have strong symptoms of COVID-19. They just tested positive when they were eventually ho hospitalized for their uh, um, catatonia signs. Shown here on the left-hand side, one of the boys has the so-called pillow sign of uh, rigidity. Um, that's uh, it's typical, apparently, of catatonia. And uh, they were able to get an FTG scan in one of the two cases, and it showed Nothing extremely dramatic. You see on the right-hand side of the screen, the summary FTG scan um, in black and white, where black dark indicates greater intensity of uh, glucose consumption. And there were some zones designated in purple in the uh, associative visual cortex here, and uh, um, in uh, one particular domain of the right, of the left uh, frontal cortex. Um, it's hard to interpret, but it is abnormal. I mean, it's not really uh, uh, strikingly, extremely um, uh, worrisome, but it suggests that there is, in fact, a kind of hypometabolism um, occurring in this, at least in this one individual, whether it's due to their uh, catatonia or uh, per se, or due to the, um, their having had a, uh, and recovered from a viral infection of the nervous system, we don't know. Um, another case study. Um, presented in, in the journal Neurology recently um, uh, shows, uh, raises an interesting, uh, another interesting red flag about uh, a rare um, comorbidity of COVID-19 uh, infection, which is a basal ganglia involvement with the basal ganglia symptoms. So we've seen, you know, uh, presumably a catatonia is generally considered to be primarily a basal ganglia disorder, but we didn't see anything uh, in the, in the FTG PET scan in that one case. However, in this study, they, uh, we had, they had a 58-year-old male who suddenly became ill with Parkinsonism and a rigid hypo, uh, hypokinetic, uh, rigid uh, agnesia. And um, they were thought to do, uh, because it looked so Parkinsonian, they did a, uh, a SPECT scan, single photon emission, uh, emission computer tomography with a standard tracer for the dopamine uh, transporters. Uh, FPCIT. And uh, they found a really dramatic uh, result in that one case where you see the left hand, on the left hand side, they spect images and um, they are distinctly uh, low uptake, showing distinctly low uptake of the tracer, indicating that there's uh, at least at the time of the scan, a massive loss of dopamine transporters. 
And you see on the right hand side, the general population based dec decline in dopamine transporters in the striatum. You see that our brains at, uh, my brain at 60 is not the same as uh, uh, exactly as the brain of a 40 year old with respect to the dopamine system. But everyone normally falls within a certain band. And this person here, the red dot, was way, way below into the region of Parkinsonism. Interestingly, nearly symmetric, maybe a bit more on on uh, one side, the um, left side, than on the right side. But uh, astonishingly, this person recovered. So whatever happened to him, um, it was not a irreversible uh, nigrostriatal degeneration, such as in Parkinson's. This was, I think, worth noticing because, of course, back to the idea of post-viral encephalitis, um, you recall hearing about the uh, dreadful uh, influenza epid epidemic of the, uh, after the Great War, uh, in which many people succumbed to a, a, a kind of catatonic syndrome that was actually a, a severe Parkinsonism because the virus killed their dopamine cells. And once dead, they don't come back. However, we're not seeing that here because if that person had had nigrostriatal degeneration, uh, there wouldn't have been a recovery. So at least sometimes the uh, dopamine system can be involved. But more frequently, the uh, uh, clinical findings are uh, in association with the, uh, the symptom of loss of olfactory sense, anosmia, which is frequently noted, uh, usually recovers quickly, um, but can persist. And that, of course, is worrisome because uh, it implies that there is a, uh, the most uh, parsimonious explanation is that the virus has found its way into the nervous system, perhaps through the uh, olfactory route and has, uh, has set up a uh, shoplet, so to say, in uh, olfactory um, uh, structures of the brain. And in this uh, case study, um, they managed to have quite incidentally followed this one individual. I think he had a, a, a pituitary tumor, prolactin, prolactinoma, so they were following him repeatedly at intervals. And uh, after the fact, he, he, he became ill sometime when he was around 19, and they uh, just he recovered from his COVID, but he developed anosmia, and uh, they happened to have the historical record of his uh, MR scan showing the olfactory bulbs here before, uh, and their, their cross-sectional area here. The, uh, um, uh, then um, after recovering from COVID, uh, there was a, about a 40% loss, no, 50% loss of the volume of the olfactory bulbs. Uh, in association with the um, anosmia. So that really is a structural change, at least in this one case. Um, what happens to the metabolism in relation to this uh, putative uh, involvement of the olfactory uh, bulb and perhaps uh, downstream structures in the olfactory pathway? And in this study from Italy, they uh, used um, FDG PET to uh, uh, measure these changes that were occurring in their population of people with persistent olfactory dysfunction. That is to say they had recovered from most of the other symptoms, but they retained their anosmia. And we see here what's now familiar to you, a, uh, a representation of the areas that are hypometabolic at low FDG uptake, shown in the hot metal color, projected upon um, a, a, a standard uh, MR-based uh, brain image. And you see that there are um, what's bilateral uh, involvement of the um, uh, parahippocampal gyrus, um, um, you know, sort of the limbic uh, temporal cortex that's uh, connected with the hippocampus, um, and is certainly integrated in the olfactory pathways. You see that uh, the other uh, zones of hypometabolism seem to have recovered, but there's a persistence of hypometabolism in this kind of bilateral olfactory structure. Um, and uh, they then proceeded to, uh, starting from that observation, conducting the same people a so-called uh, functional connectivity examination, where they also had, uh, uh, same time, I guess they had a hybrid PET fMRI scanner so that they, they could conduct uh, uh, recordings showing the bold signal fluctuation in the brain, which is the, uh, and other markers such as the uh, uh, indices of uh, 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 diffusion tensor imaging, which shows you, in fact, in effect, the integrity of white matter structures. And they started from a seed region defined as the, the region, the zone in the brain where there was the hypometabolism, and then asked the question from the MR data in the same space, um, 
which uh, um, uh, brain regions have a deficit in uh, connectivity indicative of white matter um, perturbations uh, connecting to that uh, perihippocampal gyrus region with the reduced FDG, FDG signal. And this isn't quite the right figure for functional con connectivity analysis, but it's just to say that if you, if you identify a seed where something is abnormal, you can then ask the, the data set what what uh, uh, brain regions are sort of uh, connected with that abnormality functionally in phase with the bold signal or in this case uh, correlating with the individual uh, findings of uh, uh, diffuse tensor imaging. And their result is here represented by uh, yet another uh, depiction. I call this the British racing green brain, which is the structural brain and the kind of spider webs or it looks like bread mold is actually the the zones where um, there is an, a deficit in um, um, functional connectivity that correlates, that is uh, uh, associated with the, the, the zones in the same individuals where there was hypometabolism. So the focal hypometabolism um, actually links with um, um, uh, an extended uh, uh, abnormality on the right hemisphere. Again, here we go again, uh, something about the right hemisphere. Um, to some extent on the left hemisphere, but I would say considerably more so on the, on the right hemisphere, of course the non-dominant hemisphere, where this um, um, kind of uh, sort of white matter integrity in the um, uh, uh, um, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, the ILF, which connects the uh, temporal to the um, occipital visual cortices, and is involved in high order visual and language processing, well, in, on the other side. So the FDG uh, defect manifests in um, a defect in, in connectivity of different brain regions, which seems like it would be not a good thing to have because it impairs a persistent uh, defect in kind of the broader uh, function of the brain, network functioning. And so I've come to my last slide where I will present the, the main conclusions. First, that FDG PET consistently shows a widespread pattern of cerebral hypometabolism notably in long COVID-19, and that this correlates somehow with aspects of co uh, cognitive function. Interestingly, there is a right side dominance of this deficit in adults. Second, um, um, focusing on the particular symptom of post-COVID anosmia, um, the FTG PET shows that uh, the, the hypometabolism is particularly confined in bilateral temporal structures, is, that are, is consistent with a kind of a, Long stand a long term uh, dysfunction of the downstream olfactory uh, pathways. Um, there are a few studies using uh, MR based methods that show uh, an association between the FDG uh, deficits of, of metabolism and integrity of uh, connectivity or white matter uh, bundles connecting the different brain regions. Um, that uh, implies a network. Um, uh, um, connectivity. And um, uh, the last point, I've apparently lost the slide. I apologize. And that was that um, there's some uh, research that would have been uh, perhaps interesting to this uh, psychiatry audience that um, PTSD as a long-term sequelus of COVID-19 frequently encountered I mean, people who have recovered from any serious illness uh, also has been shown to um, be related to um, some deficits in the connectivity network of the brain, um, whether uh, psychologically driven, you could say, or a biological consequence is uh, a question for philosophers or a difficult thing to disentangle. But um, uh, PTSD definitely leaves its mark on the brain, and it's something you have to consider in dealing with uh, uh, survivors of any serious illness. And the synopsis, brain imaging changes seen in COVID-19 uh, survivors may represent the composite of viral invasion by the olfactory pathway, especially implicated in the, um, in the findings of an anosmia. They may be um, the result of uh, what's happening in the periphery. A systemic cytokine storm may be um, signaling to the nervous system a, a kind of a, a neurotoxic um, a phenomenon. Um, without actually requiring the establishment of a viral infection in the brain per se. And that might account for some of the, um, the 
wide, widespread changes in glucose metabolism. And finally, um, psychological trauma and in extremis PTSD uh, may bring its, leave its own mark on the nervous system um, as distinct from the primary effects of the infection. And at this point, I think I have finished. Thank you for your attention. Dear colleagues, today we are very lucky to have as the speaker, as the lecturer, dear Professor uh, Michel Fernar, the kind of person and an amazing scientist and clinician. Uh, Professor Michel Fernar currently uh, employed in the Department of Neuroscience of the University School of Medicine, Federica II in the Naples in Italy. Uh, Professor Michel Farnara has been a student of the Harvard University in the Department of Epidemiology and uh, he has been an adjunct associate research uh, scientist in the New York State Psychiatry Institute and Columbia University several years ago. Uh, Professor Michel Farnara is an expert in bipolar disorders in adults with the emphasis on mixed features cyclothemia and also clinical psychopharmacology for modern anxiety uh, disorders. Uh, Professor Michel Farnaro also is an academic, acts as an academic editor of PLUS ONE and a reviewer for many influential peer review uh, journals. Uh, today, Professor Michel Farnaro will uh, uh, be talking about uh, his area of expertise COVID-19 among people with uh, bipolar disorder. Thank you very much for your agreement to be with us, dear Professor Michel Farnara. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Ismail Ibrahim. I'm a neurology specialist in Ibn Sina Hospital, Kuwait. And my uh, lecture today will be an updated systematic review on the association of CNSD myelination and COVID-19 infection. Uh, I have no financial disclosure in relation to this topic, and this lecture is based on our uh, systematic review that have uh, been recently published in the uh, Journal of Neurology. So the outline of my presentation will be uh, uh, start with the background, then I will discuss the objectives and methods, the results, and I will uh, classify the results into brain demyelination, spinal cord demyelination. Then I will discuss also briefly the pathophysiology of demyelination associated with COVID-19 and I will uh, end with the conclusions. Since the declaration of COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, several cases of demyelination of both the peripheral and central nervous system have been published. Uh, the association between viral infection and CNS demyelination has long been documented, and this link was recently reported following SARS-CoV-2 infection as well. The reported cases and literature included acute demyelinating uh, encephalomyelitis, ADAM, transverse myelitis, multiple sclerosis, and even a neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorder. And several pathophysiological mechanisms have been suggested. So in our study, uh, we aim to systematically review the existing literature of uh, CNS demyelination cases in association with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms. We conducted a systematic search of articles in uh, PubMed, Scopus, Embase, Cochrane, uh, Google Scholar, and other databases from the 1st of January, 2020 until June 15, 2021, uh, in accordance with PRISMA guidelines. Uh, we use the following uh, keywords, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, demyelination, demyelinating diseases, multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, and transverse myelitis. Inclusion criteria of our study were only peer-reviewed uh, publications, studies reporting early or delayed seen as demyelination after COVID-19 infection, and studies reporting possible association of cases fulfilling the diagnostic criteria of multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, ADEM, NMOSD, or MOGED, uh, and COVID-19 infection. And we excluded studies that were not published in English, uh, publications that were not peer reviewed. And uh, we also excluded uh, review papers, viewpoints, commentaries, unless reporting a case of demyelination. We also excluded cases with incomplete data regarding the imaging finding, laboratory findings, or clinical evidence of COVID-19 infection. As shown in this figure, 
Uh, our initial search uh, have found uh, around 1,400 articles, but after uh, uh, applying the inclusion and exclusion criteria and removing the duplicates, uh, only 60 studies were included in the final review with a total of 102 patients. Uh, 52 were males and 50 were, me were females with a median age of 46.5 years. Uh, as regard to brain demyelination, we identified 78 cases of brain demyelination from 38 articles. Uh, they were 40 males and 38 females with median age of 45.5 years. The most common uh, presenting neurological symptoms were lethargy, confusion, with or without seizures. And in some cases, the symptoms followed COVID-19 infection by a few weeks, while in others, they started with the initial presentation and overlapped with the COVID-19 symptoms. The demyelination mimicked a variety of conditions, but the picture of encephalitis and encephalomyelitis were the most common in 91% of cases. At the same time, also other patterns of brain demyelination like MS, NMOSD, and MOGAD were also reported, as I will discuss later, in around 10% of cases. The encephalitis and encephalomyelitis picture was the most common. And uh, among those patients, 90% had an encephalopathic picture with lethargy, loss of consciousness, with or without seizures, uh, which was supported by imaging findings as shown in the, uh, in the MRI here. The median age was also 47 uh, years. And uh, interestingly, uh, we found hemorrhage and necrosis in around 36.6% of those patients, of whom 21 suffered severe COVID-19 infection, which required mechanical ventilation. And this observation uh, could raise the possibility of a hypoxic ischemic insult affecting uh, those patients uh, uh, regarding the coagulation system in severely ill patients. Also, uh, three cases of MS uh, um, uh, patients were uh, reported, two females and one male with a mean age of 25 years. The presentation of those patients were uh, localized to the brainstem in two of them, and uh, another patient had optic neuritis. Uh, in all cases, um, the COVID-19 preceded the neurological symptom by two to four weeks, and infection was uh, usually mild. Oligoclonal bands were positive in two patients uh, and not tested in the third. However, we believe that the MRI lesions for, uh, for those patients were quite atypical, which will raise the question of whether these cases uh, actually represent uh, true MS or just a post-viral demyelination syndrome. So follow-up is mandatory to securely establish the diagnosis in such cases. Same also applies to NMO and MOGAD-like demyelination, uh, where we find two cases of NMO is the, uh, with longitudinal extensive transverse myelitis, and optic neuritis. And uh, those patients also had uh, a positive testing for aquapurin 4. Uh, same with MOGAD, only three post COVID 19 cases were reported uh, who presented with bilateral optic neuritis uh, or ADEM. And MOG antibody testing was positive in all of these patients also. And also cases followed mild infection. As regard to the spinal cord, transverse myelitis was seen in 40 cases. 24 had isolated transverse myelitis, while 16, the myelitis was a part of a diffuse demyelinating process. The cases included 19 females and 21 males. Uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis was the most frequently reported pattern in 72.5% of the cases, which is interesting. Uh, conus medullaris involvement was also seen in only three cases. As regard to demyelination in a special population, um, we had also uh, one pregnant and one postpartum case uh, of COVID-19 related brain demyelination. Uh, both had severe COVID-19 infection that required mechanical ventilation. And we know that pregnancy and preparium uh, are a case of hypercoagulable state. So this can also support the, uh, the hypoxic ischemic theory in such cases. Uh, however, these cases recovered almost completely with high doses of steroids. Uh, their presentation was typical of ADEM in one and diffuse uh, leukoencephalitis with microbleeds in the other one. Uh, another interesting area was the demyelination in the pediatric age group. We found uh, 20 pediatric cases in literature, 12 males and 8 females with a mean age of 9 years. Of them, 60% suffer from severe COVID-19 infection, um, unlike the adult population. All patients presented with picture of ADEM. 
which is interesting. And uh, five of them uh, had associated myelitis. In those patients, uh, four out of five, they had longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. Uh, fortunately, the outcome was favorable with marked or complete recovery in 13 out of the 20 patients. Isolated transverse myelitis was reported in five pediatric patients with a median age of 11 years. Also, LETM was the presenting imaging feature in all of them. Unfortunately, the outcome uh, in patients with isolated transverse myelitis uh, ranged between no improvement to partial improvement. Um, this review has shown a clear association between SARS-CoV-2 infection and the development of different types of CNSD myelination. There is an ongoing debate whether this association is related to the neurotropic feature of SARS-CoV-2 or secondary to an acute or delayed immune-mediated response. We know that coronavirus family has a neurotropic properties as previously shown in uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus, MERS, and SARS-CoV-1. Although the exact mechanism of virus spread to the CNS uh, has not yet been established, uh, the two possible explanations could be a hematogenous spread from the systemic infection to the CNS or transneuronal spread through the olfactory pathway. Um, as regard to the pathophysiology of, uh, of the CNS symptoms, um, several theories have been proposed, including direct viral infection, inflammatory response, what is known as cytokine storm, immunological complication, either para-infectious, uh, through the innate immune system or post-infectious uh, as adaptive immune system uh, through the molecular mimicry, hypercoagulable state, hypoxia and ischemia, cases of severe COVID, and also blood-brain barrier disruption. Moreover, uh, several pro-inflammatory cytokines, including several interleukins, tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma, can cross the blood-brain barrier affecting macrophages, microglia, and astrocytes, which are the principal cells that negate innate immunity in the CNS, thus creating the perfect cytokine storm uh, of a pro-inflammatory state. Specifically, interleukin-6, which is an important pro-inflammatory mediator, which can induce an immune response in the nervous system and plays a crucial role in, uh, in the, uh, regulating the immune system in MS, uh, which was proven in the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model of MS, where interleukin-6 was found to aggravate the clinical manifestation, the neuroinflammation, and demyelination uh, by uh, promoting the pathogenic uh, T helper 17 cell generation uh, in the peripheral lymphoid organs. And also in COVID-19 patients, levels of interleukin-6 were found to be correlated with disease severity and disrupting both the innate and uh, acquired immunity. Furthermore, most COVID-19 patients exhibit increased circulating levels of interleukin-17, which has a clear documented role in MS pathogenesis, mainly based on the data obtained from the EAE model. Another interesting area was the toll-like receptors, which uh, are the main pattern recognition receptors expressed by the CNS, which have played a significant role in the pathogenesis of MS uh, and the EAE model. The toll-like receptors are also believed to play a significant role in the pathogenesis of COVID-19, mainly through recognition of viral particles, activation of the innate immune system, and secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Another possible explanation could be the production of antibodies against myelin uh, triggered by the virus. Uh, this para-infectious or post-infectious etiology could be similar to uh, what we see in several cases of GBS, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, post SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, as uh, SARS-CoV-2 may also play a, a role in triggering demyelination, similar to the documented relation between uh, Epstein-Barr virus and MS. To conclude, um, COVID-19 infection has a wide uh, spectrum of neurological complication. The systematic review has shown an association between SARS-CoV-2 infection and the development of different types of CNS demyelination in literature, although causality cannot be made with absolute certainty. A probable para-infectious or post-infectious immune-mediated etiology might be implicated in patients with COVID-19. A maladaptive immune system to SARS-CoV-2 characterized by hyperactivity of innate immunity followed by immune dysregulation. Long-term prognosis of such cases is not clear, which may have implications regarding the need to use disease-modifying therapies or symptomatic treatments in such patients.
and thank you. Dear colleagues, it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ismail Ibrahim Ismail. He is the expert in neurology who has graduated from Alexandria University in Egypt and received a master's degree in neuropsychiatry from the same university. Uh, Dr. Ismail Ibrahim uh, became a fellow of the European Board of Neurology in 2017 and now he's running a neurology clinic in Ibn Sina Hospital in Kuwait already since uh, 2013. Dr. Ismail has been involved in a number of research projects, trials and has published several international publications, book chapters, and presented his research across many international conferences. What is interesting that Professor Ismail Ibrahim is touching a very important topic about the neurotropic um, effect of uh, coronavirus. And this is a very um, acute topic for us. And uh, the talk of uh, Dr. Ismail Ibrahim is titled Association of uh, Central Nervous System Demilination and SARS-CoV-2 Infection. Should we really worry? We would like to receive uh, the, ans the answer for this very important question. Thank you very much, Dr. Ismail, for being ready to share your important knowledge on the topic with us today. Okay, so the presentation deals with COVID-19 infection among people with the, a primary diagnosis of bipolar disorder. There are several preliminary considerations that we should keep in mind. The first one is that there were no warning signs until the outbreak occurred and it spread very fast. Virtually, there's no precedent antecedent all over the world in modern times, especially in the Western societies. Uh, COVID-19 is something that is uh, uh, pertinent to the whole population, not just to people with BD. And the, uh, there are both direct and indirect consequences, either to people with BD, but also to people who are in charge of patients with a diagnosis of BD. COVID-19 is also difficult to handle with existing medications, especially in the acute phase, while prevention and vaccination are currently available are still a matter of debate for a number of reasons. But the very first question for us is, uh, is the COVID-19 virus able to invade the brain? The short answer is yes. Uh, the virus is able to penetrate the olfactory mucosa causing loss of smell and it may enter the brain, migrating from the cryophon plate along to the olfactory tract or to the vagal or the trigeminal pathways. Cytokines and microglia activation lead to neurotoxicity, so severe cytokine storm with increased serum levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines including interleukin 1, 6, 10 and tumor necrosis factor TNF. Inflammation leads to blunted monomine neurotransmission anhedonia, negative cognitive, psychomotor or neurovegetative symptoms, depression and possibly to suicidal behavior, which poorly respond to conventional antidepressant. Virus enters into the endothelial cells of the brain vasculature, activates neutrophils, macrophage, thrombin production and complement pathways, promoting microthrombi deposition into the brain. So yes, there's a, a lot of implications related to the invasion of the COVID-19 virus into the brain, especially the, in, in terms of inflammation cascades. And this is also relevant to, in conjunction with uh, what some, uh, at least several, medications routinely prescribed to people with BD may, do, may cause in terms of inflammatory modulation. Uh, this is something that refers to the second generation antipsychotics, but uh, also pertains to other drugs and also to other factors, including diet. Uh, diet is extremely important for inflammation, but also smoking. Uh, this is also relevant to when we will consider obesity and other issues related to inflammation in, among people with VD. 
So the first part of the presentation is about what we know, or we should know about the COVID-19 infection and its implication for people with BD. Uh, social distancing and the regulation that were applied all over the world by several countries and lockdowns were responsible for loneliness and so people with BD are particularly sensitive to this kind of uh, condition. Uh, social and circadian rhythmicity is also extremely important because the dysregulation of uh, circadian rhythms is uh, uh, tightly uh, jointed with uh, mood disorders and the opposite is also true. And this is also relevant in, in terms of uh, higher chance of suicides. There's also an increased uh, uh, screen time and consumption of convenience junk foods. There's decreased exercise and consumption of alcohol is increased. So, that, so it is the tobacco smoking. What happens is that people with BD infected with COVID-19 have been reported to have an increased rate of suicide. But this is still a matter of debate and um, additional evidence reports are needed on the matter because in the very first wave, since the infection spread, people uh, with BD may have faced increased rates of suicide, but the, this kind of uh, wave should have blunted quickly. So this is something that we should uh, study in more and uh, further detail. There's also a problem related with hesitance. So uh, people who are diagnosed with BD, but not necessarily just people with bipolar disorder, also the general population may be reluctant to get vaccinated. And there are a number of reasons for this. And the very first one is a poor information or in, in inadequate information. There are also reduced chances of access to non-COVID-19 related primary care, which uh, um, jeopardize long-term adherence in BD. So if people is unable to attend their uh, outpatient facilities and to get, for example, long acting antipsychotics or just, you know, regular visit or follow ups, there are chances that they may, uh, you know, um, uh, worsen their adherence. What we know, what we know about the susceptibility uh, between uh, that people with uh, or without a pre-existing diagnosis of mood disorder may have. So this is about mood disorder in general. So we are now including people with BD and major depressive disorder. And the reason why is that uh, the, the evidence available at this time did not, did not provide clear cut stratification of BD people. So we know that people who have a pre-existing diagnosis of any mood disorder have increased susceptibility and we see that the cumulative effect size here, the odd ratio is 1.27, so a slightly higher chance. When it comes to the next uh, outcome, which is COVID-19 hospitalization, we see also that people with any mood, pre-existing mood disorder, so including BD, but not just BD, have also inflated rates of hospitalization compared to people without an existing, pre-existing diagnosis of mood disorder. Well, when it comes to severe events related to COVID-19 in terms of any kind of severe outcome, there was no real, real difference. It is almost one the old. Death is uh, death uh, tolls are higher among people with a pre-existing condition of mood disorder any. Well, when it comes to BDs, we uh, could not uh, get the relevant a number of results stratified according to the diagnosis against the MDD. But still, uh, these slides means that uh, if we look at the single studies regarding BD, there are a few here, we see that they have a slightly lower rates of uh, increased mortality compared to MDD. We still know why and we need the replication studies. What it matters is that uh, in the best scenario, so we should uh, uh, attempt to do primary prevention. So we want to uh, prevent people to get infected with COVID-19. Secondary prevention means we may want to prevent people who have already got infected with COVID-19 get new infection or other kind of strictly related, uh, you know, consequences. 
Tertiary prevention is more about the long-term consequences and the effects, the detrimental effects due to the infection. So we already knew since, since the year 2011 that the coronavirus family were uh, uh, quite common among people with bipolar disorders, actually any mood disorder again. Uh, and, and yet, when it came, uh, so we were not able to, uh, you know, to study and report in the, in the year 2011, uh, the 2019 virus, obviously. But still, the coronavirus family was quite common among people who had an history of mood disorder, as it was the case of uh, the is, uh, influenza type A or type B. But in the case of the coronaviruses, there was no... Uh, 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 no effect of uh, the, um, so, so I can read from here, <laughs> the psychomotor symptoms or other uh, kind of uh, uh, predictors compared to them in other uh, influenza virus. So yeah, this kind of slide is more for your convenience because I'm not going to into full in detail right now, but it's just for your convenience in case you want to look more in detail about the, the um, interactions with uh, the commonly prescribed drugs in the uh, internal medicine care for people with, uh, infected with COVID-19 and those uh, of the uh, outcomes related with the interactions with the major psychotropic drugs that are routinely prescribed with people with ED. Basically, uh, we know that there are uh, also the opposite in terms of inter interactions. So uh, there are also some sort of drugs that are um, uh, usually prescribed with people with SMI, severe mental illness, including BD, that may end in interaction with uh, uh, internal medicine drugs. And also these slides provide a snapshot about what the major events are. It is also interesting to recall that people have uh, reported that this is, uh, to my, my opinion, this is just something that we should consider as a proof of concept report, that lithium may play a sort of antiviral effect. Well, in the clinical, clinical practice, uh, I will not prescribe lithium to people who get infected for COVID-19 unless they are bipolar disorder people and they really need lithium at that time. So, but still, it is interesting to recall that lithium and the lithium mimetic drugs like the Epsilon do actively uh, modulate inflammation. Also, other drugs, as I anticipated in the earlier slides, like antipsychotics, or at least several antipsychotics, uh, may have detrimental effects on inflammation. And so they may, and th therefore, they may uh, theoretically impair, impair the uh, COVID-19 infection among people with BD. Uh, there are also therapies that are other than pharmacotherapy for people with BD and uh, in COVID-19 infection. And the best thing to focus at is that uh, we should keep uh, these people closely monitored, especially for circadian rhythms and sleep hours, which is crucial for mood stability. This can, do, uh, this can be made on an online platform, so a uh, e healthcare, electronic healthcare medicine. And uh, flexibility also and the availability of mental health workers is the key. So we sh recommend more uh, follow frequent follow-up when it is impossible to do in, uh, in live, in person, we should uh, deliver this uh, via uh, teleconference. The problem is that people who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder and also are old age people, the elderly, old, old age BD, have lower chance of getting in touch with their uh, caregivers with uh, electronic and uh, vi video conference because most people who are um, older people is still less you know, uh, confident when using computers of internet of this kind of uh, uh, resource. So this is an issue. They are also, there are also a lower access to treatment, including ACT, which is uh, uh, an issue, uh, and also uh, lower skills for smart apps and uh, also higher chance of interaction with their existing medication for the general care. The second and last part of the presentation deals with what we know 
we, we would like to know. So this is why we delivered a scoping review, which is uh, uh, something that uh, was intended to focus on the a, a priori determined questions that we were uh, looking to better ad address. The first one was uh, what are the effects of pandemic related social isolation on mental health of people with BD? Also, what are the barriers to seeking or pro and providing care to people with BD? in the COVID-19 area and how to, uh, you know, to increase the chance of, uh, for people with BD to get vaccinated. What is the prevalence of COVID-19 infection and the risk of transmission among people with BD compared to the general population? What are the possible causes for different clinical course of BD with co-occurring COVID-19? What are the solutions? What is known about the potential pharmacological interaction? So our intent was to look at the literature by um, uh, following several inclusion and exclusion criteria. And the major inclusion criteria were the presence of a, a definitive diagnosis of BD made according to either the DSM or the ICD or and also uh, vouched and uh, established with a, a semi-structured interview like the skid or this sort of uh, questionnaires or interviews and also we excluded narrative reviews and uh, we were able to detect 14 potential hits and here you see that uh, there were different most of them were cross-sectional reports and uh, there are very few at this time uh, retrospective or prospective court, which is obvious because we need more follow-up uh, to provide uh, further uh, expanded uh, prospective studies. So uh, there were all, uh, there were there were they were all observational studies at this time, and this is quite intuitive. Also, the studies were quite uh, uh, in you know the, the studies documented the infection state among people with D only. In a, in a low num in the low proportion of cases. So this means that most of the studies were not really documenting the infection among people with BD. So concerning the very first question that was part of our scopes, what is the impact of COVID-19 related stress on people, on people with our bipolar disorder? So first of all, on this 11 studies, uh, were uh, collected concerning this uh, issue, this topic, and studies found that people with BD reported low rates of relapse or symptom worsening, which is uh, possibly unexpected for someone, but this is still what the experience says so far during the pandemic, or less severe psychiatric symptoms. Some people say that uh, speculated that this could be related to the, uh, you know, to the, um, uh, the experience with stress that people with BD already have compared to people without any diagnosis of BD. So this is a comparison with the pre-pandemic period. Uh, when they were compared to the MDD people, BD showed, showed the lower rates of psychological and uh, uh, distress. But this is just uh, um, supported by one study. While in two studies, people with BD compared to the healthy controls reported worse cognitive symptoms or more elevating pandemic related stress, sleep difficulties or anxiety and slower improvement after the first month of the pandemic. But still again, we need extended follow up and obviously more replication studies. Three cases. So three case rappers, actually a case series uh, described that the onset of manic episodes during the lockdown period in non-infected females and without with previous psychiatric history. So overall, no, there was no sufficient information about the infection state, according to five studies. And in six studies, there most of the sample did not screen positive to the COVID-19 infection. When it comes to the impact of COVID-19 mental health service utilization, we were able to detect eight studies on the matter and seven studies uh, uh, reported that uh, the authors uh, specified that they evaluated the included patient in the framework of telepsychiatry consultation, which is uh, reassuring to us. One study found that during the first four weeks of the pandemic, BD patients were more likely to get hospitalized compared to the pre-pandemic pre period. 
And then when it comes to uh, bipolar disorder and the risk for COVID-19 infection, we were able to detect uh, only one large study uh, focused, focused on the impact of mental disorder and the risk of COVID infection. So patients with a recent diagnosis of BD had higher odds of screening positive uh, for COVID-19 compared to people without a mental disorder overall. Among these patients, African-American females of any racial background had higher odds of screening positive to the COVID-19 infection compared to their uh, Caucasian or male counterparts, respectively. So engagement in preventative behavior and among people with bipolar disorder is also crucial because people with bipolar disorder may be uh, more reluctant to follow strict regulation, especially when they are manic or severely depressed, when they live alone and the other issue may also account for this. One study uh, uh, focused on the assessment on the rates of engagement in the specific preventative behaviors compared to people with either the schizophrenia spectrum uh, or compared to people with, um, you know, in terms of uh, self-distancing and avoiding. And at the end of the day, there was no real difference with them. So this is a snapshot that you may want to stop and uh, look at this, because this is a summary of, about the number of studies concerning different outcomes. So the bigger the, the bubble, the, the higher the number of studies that were investigating this kind of outcome. So what are the conclusions here? The very first thing is that inflammation and immunity do converge and do play major roles in terms of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality for people with BD uh, exposed uh, uh, to COVID-19 virus. We should promote primary prevention whenever possible and uh, try to engage people with BD in preventative behaviors. We should also try to involve them in telemedicine and telepsychiatry. Psychosocial and psychopharmacological management should be tightly jointed all together, while vaccine hesitation and healthcare barriers is something that should deserve additional information, as also for special populations, including BD. Uh, there are several areas of research that reserve uh, further attention, as we, we uh, highlighted, uh, highlighted with the scoping reviews, uh, and but still we think that uh, this is uh, something that is due to the fact that we need the longer follow-up. So thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, it's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, dearest Professor Avanesh de Souza, who is our great support of the International Center for Education and Research in Neuropsychiatry and who supports all the initiatives in research and uh, educational activities and publishing. And every time we um, ask for support and every time we invite Professor Avanesh de Souza, we receive uh, yes. And uh, um, it's an enormous energy which uh, Professor Avanesh de Souza kindly sharing with the whole world of uh, professionals and patients. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, Professor Avanesh de Souza currently works at the Department of Psychiatry of Lakmania Tilak um, Medical. Uh, Municipal General Hospital and uh, Lakmani Tilak Municipal Medical College in Mumbai. And also Professor Avanesh de Souza is uh, um, the member of the International Faculty of UNESCO Chair in Bioethics. And uh, what is important that Professor Avanesh de Souza published more than 300 international papers, also book chapters and books in different uh, fields of the um, uh, studies in psychiatry, uh, about dementia, about the uh, evidence-based approach and psychopharmacology of um, mental disorders and many others and you can search and see on the internet in enormous activities which Professor Avanesh de Souza can um, um, demonstrate to our psychiatric community. Uh, Professor Avanesh de Souza is not only the expert in psychiatry, he has a master's in psychology and even MBA in human resource development and maybe that's why he is an amazing organist. Um, manager, organizer of uh, 
uh, all these uh, professional activities, which really gives opportunities for our patient to receive much help and much assistance from um, you know, Professor Avinash D'Souza and his extended team. Professor Avinash D'Souza also holds a D'Souza Foundation, which supports early career psychiatrists and research in uh, the field of uh, psychiatry and psychopharmacology. We are planning the project on pharmacogenetics or uh, psychosis soon. And uh, today, Professor Avinash D'Souza will be talking about psychopharmacotherapy and COVID-19, the critical issues we should pay attention at. Thank you very much for being with us again today, Professor. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. My uh, topic for today is uh, COVID-19 and uh, psychopharmacology. Of course, we will discuss certain aspects of neurobiology as well, because it's uh, relevant when we discuss about uh, COVID and uh, drug interactions that we can't shy away from neurobiology. Uh, what's very important to understand is that psychotropics also form an inherent part and, and psychopharmacology forms an inherent part of neurobiology. And the reason that we're discussing COVID-19 and psychotropics is because we're going to have many scenarios wherein you may have patients who have psychiatric conditions like depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, many other conditions who develop COVID. You may have patients who develop COVID-19 and then develop psychiatric complications of COVID-19, like they may develop a post-COVID depression or a post-COVID anxiety. So these kind of situations may arise. And there are multiple drug-drug interactions between the medications used in the treatment of COVID and psychiatric medications that we need to look at. Uh, the interaction basically will exist because we have COVID-19, which is a new infection on one hand. We have a pre-existing psychiatric disorder. So you may have someone with depression, anxiety, schizophrenia pre-existing. And you may also have the same patient having uh, blood pressure or diabetes or hypertension. So pre-existing medical disorder also, which is there, or a pre-existing neurological disorder also, which is there. So there the situation becomes more and more difficult. Also, there are very few COVID units all over the world which are specialized for psychiatric patients. So we don't have COVID units which are specialized. So we need to go into this aspect. And we're having more and more data now on uh, cognitive impairment, fatigue, um, aggression, mood swings, and a lot of other neuropsychiatric manifestations which are developing post-COVID, which we didn't know uh, earlier. Now, we move straight on to some of the medications which are used. And generally, you may have a patient who is already on clozapine, maintained on clozapine, because clozapine is one of our drugs which we use widely when it comes to treatment resistance schizophrenia, and uh, develops COVID-19. Now, what are the main concerns? Should we continue clozapine or should we stop clozapine? Now, the key issue here is that generally we have some patients who, when they get a viral infection, they may develop neutropenia. So the 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 data says that if your WBC counts are more than 3.5 or neutrophil counts are more than 2, you're in the green area, you continue clozapine. If it's in the range of 1.5 to 2 and 3 to 3.5, which is the amber area, we monitor frequency. And if it's less than 3, we stop clozapine. Now, most patients with COVID-19 in our experience, we've continued clozapine therapy. We've not seen neutropenia develop to a large extent. But what's very important is that whether with the high fever, of COVID-19 and COVID-19 as a viral infection, does it increase the chances of clozapine induced seizures, particularly for patients which are maintained on 300 or 400 mg of clozapine? So this becomes a slight issue that we need to worry about. Other than that, clozapine is rather safe when it comes to using uh, with COVID-19 patients. Another issue is we have a lot of patients in India, particularly who are maintained on lithium. And we all know lithium is one of the old mood stabilizers, which has been used very regularly for the management of bipolar disorder. And uh, the main concern with lithium and COVID-19 is that a lot of patients with COVID-19 develop uh, renal issues and some, sometimes renal complications may develop. Now, in such patients, keeping them on lithium may worsen their acute renal condition. And lithium tends to interact with a number of drugs and you need to monitor lithium levels. So normally, 
they they advise whether we should stop lithium or continue lithium the other issue that comes up is that uh, you monitor serum lithium very regularly and based on what the lithium levels show you you decide whether to continue lithium or stop lithium and uh, when it comes to prescribing medications for the fever you would prefer to prescribe uh, paracetamol which is safer than prescribing ibuprofen with lithium so that's something which you would have to monitor also the covid-19 flu is known to sometimes precipitate lithium toxicity because of the various metabolic changes that happen so one needs to be a little careful when a patient is on lithium and develops covid-19 what are the high risk groups that we monitor with lithium and covid-19 one is elderly patients of course uh, children and adolescents of course anybody who has a chronic kidney condition um, any patient with covid-19 and raised calcium levels that should ring a bell that we have to monitor lithium any patient with a pre-existing thyroid condition either hypo or hyperthyroidism needs to be monitored anyone who's been irregular with medications poor adherence or poor symptom control any other drugs which are interacting with lithium but the main marker is that the moment your serum lithium serum lithium levels go above 0.8 we sort of monitor and that is the time when we have to look at toxicity a key issue that has always been complicating psychiatrists and specialists from the covid-19 spectrum is whether benzodiazepines should be used or not in patients with covid-19 the main concern being that benzodiazepines may induce respiratory depression and covid-19 patients develop pneumonia so the issue very often is one of sedation and the issue is that uh, in a sedated state you may not be able to assess whether the patient is able to respire properly or not and there are many patients who in a covid-19 ward uh, in an icu uh, for that matter even the diagnosis of covid-19 itself could induce a panic attack now in such cases whether we should prescribe benzodiazepines or not is the main uh, concern well as long as the po2 is normal as long as the respiratory pattern is fine you could prescribe low dose benzodiazepines for a short period when i mean short period i mean a week two weeks three weeks maximum but you monitor po2 at every stage you monitor respiration at every stage uh, benzodiazepines like oxazepam and lorazepam are preferred we we try to avoid the longer acting benzodiazepines like clodazepoxide or we try to avoid clonazepam as far as possible alprazolam is avoided because of its abuse potential so oxazepam and lorazepam are the ones which we prefer um a very important question which none of the researchers and none of us have been able to answer is which is the antidepressant of choice for covid-19 well all antidepressants are safe uh we have to monitor however once you start we have to be a little more careful with tricyclic antidepressant use because of host of anticholinergic side effects that you see with them uh ssris are safe but acidity bleeding is a common side effect with ssris and one has to be careful and monitor that as well but for covid ssris are supposed to be safer than the snri that is uh fluoxetine or certain or acetylopram may be much better than duloxetine or velafaxine or desvenafaxine there are some reports of bupropion being used uh there are some studies that have said sertralin melnasepran and vertioxetine works better uh fluoxamine has come into the limelight because fluoxamine was one of the ssris that was shown to be effective against covid-19 itself so there have been some studies that have said that you know you could use fluoxamine as an antidepressant and anti-anxiety agent and it would have the dual action of working on covid as well as the mood when it comes to antipsychotic use in covid-19 the main concern is antipsychotic induced adverse events now a lot of patients in the covid-19 illness phase are more prone to extrapyramidal side effects of antipsychotics so one needs to be careful when you prescribe these drugs also because the heart may be a little weak you may see some qtc prolongation and sedation with these medications so one has to monitor well risperidone is one of the drugs which we have to use with caution though it's a widely used drug in other scenarios so olanzapine is our first choice in many of these patients though olanzapine also has metabolic side effects but weight loss occurs a lot with covid so olanzapine might just help in sort of maintaining the weight and it might be a good drug to choose paliperidone is safer than the other drugs though 
data is not very much available. We have to avoid drugs like ziprasidone and certindol that probably act on the QT interval. In an ICU setting, haloperidol is preferred because it can be given IV and IM also. So you need not give it orally. So in the ICU management, you may prefer the older antipsychotics compared to the atypicals. For sedation, some people have recommended that quetiapine in a low dose may be, may be useful. Though haloperidol has some additional action on sigma receptors that play some role with uh, COVID-19, though it's unknown. Uh, many of uh, uh, the patients who are on COVID-19 are prescribed chloroquine or prescribed HCQS and chloroquine initially um, and azithromycin. Chloroquine is a drug which is notorious to induce psychosis as a side effect. Uh, some patients have known to also get psychosis with azithromycin. So one has to be careful when you prescribe these drugs. Uh, antipsychotic use has to be very judicious when you have patients <clears throat> who have metabolic syndrome. So they have diabetes and they already have hypertriglyceridemia so you need to monitor sugars as well as uh, lipids because these may go haywire in a patient with covid uh, when we spoke about mood stabilizers we already have spoken in detail about lithium and i'm not going to go there but we have to reduce the dose of carbamazepine because carbamazepine is known to cause some amount of bone marrow depression in covid and you need to be careful with neutrophil counts when using this drug uh, when it comes to valproate you can increase the dose because because the drugs that are used in COVID somehow reduce the serum levels of valproate. So you may have to increase the dose of valproate and lamotrigine. There is really no best mood stabilizer to be used in COVID, but uh, I would say that we would look at uh, valproate and divalproex as our first choice rather than lithium or carbamazepine. Can COVID cause mania? Well, not, not many cases of COVID-induced mania have been reported. Uh, though they've said that if you're prescribing a drug like gabapentin, uh, you need to monitor the dose because GABA itself can cause respiratory depression and can cause some issues. Now, generally, when you look at psychotropics and COVID-19, there are an array of drug-drug interactions, and these drug-drug interactions are due to the interactions with cytochrome P450. So one, there may be pharmacodynamic interactions which result in additive or synergistic activity of the drugs. There may be drug-drug interactions due to the stage and severity of the disease, depending on what stage of COVID he's in. There may be some pharmacogenetic factors with cytochrome P450 that may also cause these interactions. What's very important is that clinically relevant drug interactions between psychotropic agents and COVID-19 result from a pharmacokinetic or pharmacodynamic properties of the medications, and they may be caused by the drug disease impact of COVID itself, because COVID leads to multi-organ failure, COVID leads to cytokine storm. These things work neurobiologically, and they might therefore cause the drug drug interactions that you see in COVID. Uh, amongst the drugs which are used for COVID, well, it's well known that uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, and diarunavir, or uh, cobicistat, pose the major concerns in interaction with psychotropic agents. Uh, concomitant administration protease inhibitors with haloperidol, quetiapine, etc., should be avoided because of increased toxicity. So this is something which studies have shown. Uh, there is a low risk of interactions with other drugs like corticosteroids, heparin, remdesivir, or anti-GAK inhibitors. So it's relatively safe. And psychotropic agents exhibit a favorable profile like sertraline, vertioxin, olanzapine, oxazepam like benzodiazepines should be preferred. We must use more of these drugs rather than risperidone or fluoxetine or escitalopram. So this is a diagram which you know uh, looks at uh, the stages of COVID. So you have an early stage, which is an outpatient stage where you would use antiretrovirals. Then comes the inpatient stage where ramodis, where colchicin, corticosteroids, and the other drugs come in. And a later stage, atoclizumab and the other immunosuppressants come in play. Now, here again, as an outpatient, you may have to just prescribe anulytics. As inpatient, sedation and delirium treatment comes in play. And in an ICU management sedation and delirium again comes into play. So based on what stage of code you are, whether it's a mild virus in, viral infection or there is a systemic hyperinflammation, you may have to choose the psychotropics that you would want to choose in such cases. Uh, similarly, when you look at outpatient and inpatient uh, management of COVID, what is important is that uh, 
the oral antidepressant use may be stopped in ICU patients. The QTC interval may be there due to several interactions of antidepressants and retrovirals. Similarly, when you look at haloperidol and quetiapine with antiretroviral should be avoided and you should increase the dose of haloperidol if you're using anti-interleukin drugs. Prefer oxazepam like benzodiazepines, which are preferred. Uh, Sometimes it can happen that uh, you may also have to increase the dose of midazolam if you're using anti-interleukin-1 or interleukin-6 drugs. So one needs to be careful when you're using antivirals or anti-inflammatory drugs with psychotropics. This is a very complicated chart. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. But what's very important is the green squares are the lowest risk for interactions with psychotropic drugs. And as you can see, <coughs> a drug like Tocizumab, which is on the right-hand side, set last column, has the lowest interactions with all psychotropic agents. Tocizumab is a preferable drug if you have a patient on a host of psychiatric medication. Similarly, low molecular weight heparin work well. But if you look at other drugs, all the other drugs show some kind of side effects or some kind of interactions. Though all are moderate and low, the S-citalopram is one of the drugs we avoid. Uh, haloperidol we avoid with chloroquine. So overall, most of the drugs can be given, but toclizumab is the safest when it comes to the COVID agent to be used with psychotropic uh, medication. There are uh, interesting papers, uh, one by Gatti et al., which looks at various drug interactions between psychotropics and COVID, which you could go through. There's another very important evidence review by Ostuli et al., which uh, is also something that one could look at. Uh, there are review, review articles by Bill Bull et al., which are there. Uh, we spoke about psychopharmacology in one of the works that uh, I have written with Dr. Mohandas and Dr. Javed on critical issues when it comes to treating COVID-19 positive patients in low and uh, middle income countries like India, particularly, which has been published by the British Journal of Psychiatry International. So one could uh, go through that paper as well. We've also wondered as to you know what are the challenges particularly because affordability of covid drugs is low um, in india and so psychological issues uh, in covid 19 is something we've considered in one of our review papers along with the interface of psychiatry and covid 19 so this is something which i would uh, you could email me and i would send you the full text if you need to go through it we also have written an interesting editorial on covid 19 and psychopharmacology in a journal known as the annals of indian psychiatry which is a journal i edit and it's a good journal which uh, it's a good editorial which you could get a bird's eye view of the psychopharmacological issues that concern us. What's very important is that you have to assess the needs of the patient. You assess the vulnerability. You assess the medications you use. And then you take an informed choice. There's no clear-cut guideline as to what must be used and what must not be used. Uh, with respiratory depression, as I said, we have to look. If a patient has respiratory depression, See that you choose a drug that has less sedative potential. See that you have a drug that doesn't cause a lot of sialuria. See that the pharmacokinetic factor are not pro-sedative. Monitor PO2. If you have a patient with QTC prolongation, avoid drugs that cause QT prolongation. Uh, monitor his existing cardiovascular status, baseline 2D echo, ECG, etc. And you monitor serum electrolytes. This is what you basically do. You may have patients with COVID-19 who have coagulation or bleeding problems. In such cases, uh, you must know that antidepressants and antipsychotics may increase the risk of thromboembolism, provided these are not treated. So one has to sometimes be careful when you're prescribing SSRIs or SNRIs in patients who are on heparin. One has to be a little careful in those cases. Always do a pre-existing bleeding coagulation profile and monitor that. So regular monitoring is a key. So amongst all the COVID-19 medications, these are all that we use in India and of course over the world as well, Remedesivir, Favipavir, they are all used very successfully and they all have some interactions. As I said, Toclizumab is the only one which is safe, but it's given mainly the end stage. It's not the first stage of COVID, so it's not something that you would use as a first line drug. Um, all COVID vaccines are safe with antidepressants. So very often we have a lot of patients who call up and want to know that since I'm on psychiatric medication, can I take the COVID vaccine? All the vaccines any make is absolutely safe with psychiatric drugs. So you could go ahead and take the vaccine. You don't need to miss your dose unless you develop very high fever. Then you may skip a dose, but otherwise you need not miss your dose. Thank you.
Dear colleagues, it's my own and pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Carla Ignacio Catane, who works in Navarra, um, in Bergamanera, Italy. Now, Associate Professor Carl Ignacio Catane has defended his thesis, PhD in anticonvulsants, and really is an expert in the field. So we are very lucky to listen to his lecture and very important uh, points on uh, lithium and anticonvulsants use and uh, their immunomodulatory effect in SARS-CoV-2 infection. Thank you very much, dear Prof. Uh, Carla Catania for being with us, for agreement to share your knowledge and uh, see you soon at the next meeting. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank Daria Smirnova for her invitation. My speech is a part of a high-level scientific program and I hope it measures up such an eminent faculty. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Carlo Ignazio Cattaneo. I'm a clinician. My clinical and research topic are resistant mood disorder, adult ADHD, and neurostimulation. I've got a PhD in neuropsychopharmacology. I wish to thank Francesca Ressico, a brilliant colleague, who helped me with the speech. We are now used to web conferences Nonetheless, this 1,900 portrait had already predicted we would look like this is in the 21st century. No pictures predicting COVID anyway. I do sincerely declare I am no expert in the field of COVID nor immunology. This is to avoid the Dunning-Kruger effect, according to which the incompetent does not know he is incompetent. I prefer to label myself as overtly uninformed and go on with my speech. Before disclosures, I'm showing up a picture from our surroundings. That is San Giulio Island on Lake Corta. Legend says that San Giulio defeated the dragon haunting the island and threatening people, where we may hope San Giulio can shed some light on Novax clusters. Here it is a brief overview of my speech. I'm going to talk about COVID-19 infection and immune system, COVID-19 infection and CNS inflammation, psychotropics and pneumonia, lithium and valproate immunomodulatory profile. I'm no virologist nor an immunologist, so I'm not going to describe this slide in depth. I just want to point out that COVID infection most likely evolves to a systemic level, depending on the amplification and dysfunctionality of the immune response. An example is given by the well-established steroid early treatment with an anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant activity. We can then infer that molecules with immunomodulatory properties can exert a therapeutic action against the infection. This is what happens in the CNS from an anatomopathological point of view. The amplified inflammatory response and pro-coagulative condition determine an endothelial damage, which also involves the cerebral microcirculation and the general neuroinflammation condition. We might then suppose that major psychiatric syndromes, usually characterized by an altered immune response and neuroinflammation, may show even more severe consequences from COVID infection. One of the most trivial considerations about severe psychiatric patients being at a higher risk of developing pneumonia is associated to their poor self-care. Yet specific biological mechanisms are involved, including the antidopaminergic action of antipsychotics, weakening reflexes and muscular reactivity, swallowing and respiratory muscles, and a central action such as that on neuropeptide P and antihistaminergic effect. Moreover, the spectrum of late onset movement disorder can also involve the pharynx and larynx, thus determining an increased risk. 
All medication inducing sialurea clozapine above all increase risk. This meta-analysis, on the contrary, shows that patients treated with additional lithium seem to have a risk similar to those not under antipsychotic treatment. And what about the lithium paradox? Mortality data show psychiatric patients increased risk. The risk increases either in schizophrenia or bipolar, but it is a bit lower in bipolar spectrum, and the risk is related to antipsychotic use and dosage. But there are no post hoc analyses about lithium or mood stabilizers. It seems that lithium treated patients might have a slight lower risk of coagulative or respiratory fatal complications. Here are two recent papers describing the multiple immunomodulatory effect of lithium. So lithium acts as an immunomodulator, enhancing the immune response, possibly performing direct antiviral effect and inducing a global anti-inflammatory effect. And this is a similar table summarizing the potential positive effect of valproate on COVID-19 infection. A very recent paper published in the European Journal of Psychiatry suggests a direct action on the histone deacetylase with both a reduction of the AC2 enzyme and the transmembrane 2 proper protease, thus preventing the virus from entering cells and modulating the immune response and organ damage. And here you are the conclusions at the end of my brief speech. Liter literature agrees in stating that patients suffering from psychiatric syndromes of the psychotic and bipolar spectrum show higher infection and mortality rates than general population. This can be explained both in terms of life habits and self-care and due to the effect of psychoactive medication, which are in every respect medication with a systemic action. Lithium well-known immunostimulating and modulating action may have a positive effect on the development of COVID-induced illness. And thank you. Uh, dear professors, dear colleagues, dear students, dear all participants of our symposium, of our meeting of the Train Computer Interface 2021 conference, um, we um, are happy and uh, lucky to share our knowledge with you today. Uh, but the topic is quite sad and complicated about the effect of COVID-19 on mental health, and we sincerely hope uh, to see you soon in the post-pandemic era, which will be better in terms of mental health, in terms of physical health, in terms of um, um, health services uh, functioning. And I um, will be happy to hug you all. Thank you very much, all the speakers, all the organizers. Thank you very much for being together. Stay together, stay safe. Bye-bye. Dear friends, today was a fantastic day. Many thanks to the speakers and moderators for their outlook on the new psychiatric problems caught in the pandemic. We are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow at two interesting symposiums, Neural Interfaces and Neurotechnologies in Rehabilitation and a symposium on Mathematical Neuromodeling. We start at 12 o'clock, Samara time. Please use the same link to connect. See you soon.